The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. And without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitations in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. As a reminder to the members, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you are not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. Consistent with House rules, staff will only mute members as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum, and I now recognize myself for opening remarks. Pursuant to notice, the full committee meets today for the first time in its history to examine the state of human rights of LGBTQI plus persons abroad. And I want to, of course, start off by saying Happy Pride Month. And I'm very pleased to be holding this hearing I look forward to the witnesses' expert testimony, personal experiences, and recommendations on continued advocacy to stop violence and discrimination against the LGBTQI plus community. Now let me be clear. When I say advancing and protecting the LGBTQI plus rights, we are talking about the human rights that is owned to every person on this planet regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, or sex characteristics. Around the world, LGBTQI plus communities face stigma, unjust criminalization, threats of violence, persecution, and in certain cases, death because of who they are or whom they love. According to the CRS, approximately 70 countries have laws criminalizing same-sex relations between consulting adults. And at least nine countries have national laws criminalizing forms of gender expression that target transgender and gender non-conforming people. Many of these laws subject individuals to abuses like forced anal examinations, cruel penalties ranging from fines to life imprisonment, and even the death penalty in certain countries. Even in countries where there are no enforced laws, LGBTQI plus communities continue to face social stigma and lack of equal access to health services, employment, and protection. LGBTQI plus refugees seeking to flee persecution additionally face long wait times, vague policies, and oftentimes abuse while waiting for their cases to be considered. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated these inequities as gaps in access to health care have worsened and authoritarian governments exploited emergency powers to target and harass LGBTQI plus communities. Recently, Hungary's authoritarian leader, Viktor Orban, has abused emergency powers to pass anti-LGBTQI plus legislation, and in Uganda, Police have used social distancing measures to conduct anti-LGBTQI plus raids on shelters. These examples, unfortunately, are not unique. It is not a coincidence that the worst abuses against the LGBTQI plus community are happening in countries with authoritarian leaders and illiberal institutions. Now, I applaud the Biden administration's commitment to advancing the human rights of LGBTQI plus individuals as laid out in the February executive order. I also appreciate Secretary Blinken's commitment to updating deficiencies within the Department of State reporting, filling the LGBTQI plus special envoy vacancy, increasing the LGBTQI plus representation within the Foreign Service, and ending a policy that denied American citizenship to the children of same-sex couples born abroad. As we move forward, it is important that we have critical conversations that impact the LGBTQI plus communities like the repeal of the global gag rule and PEPFAR reform. 
We must also bolster support and funding for the civil society groups that, that are doing the work on the ground to ensure people live dignified lives without fear or oppression. Now, the United States can lead by example, speaking out when necessary and passing bills into laws like the Equity Act, the Voting Rights Act, as well as the Global Respect Act and the GLOBE Act, authored by our committee members, Mr. Cicilline and Ms. Titus. As we'll hear from our witnesses, the threats posed to the LGBTQI plus people around the world are dire. They deserve the same basic human rights all human beings are entitled to. They, to free speech, to free assembly, to not be assaulted, tortured, or discriminated against. So let me just close by honoring those trailblazers who took the risks, often in the face of personal persecution, to advance the cause of human rights of the LGBTQI plus individuals. Our witness today embody that moral courage to speak out and do what is just, just and right. And I thank you for your work and courage, for your valuable and historic testimony before the committee today. Building on this hearing and other work of Congress, we must do our part, enact laws, change policies, and speak out so that every person is treated equally and can live openly and have the opportunity to thrive. I will now recognize my colleague and friend, Mr. McCall, for his opening statement. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witness. Uh, our country is founded on the principle that all people are created equal. This ideal is the bedrock of our founding documents. But as we all know, making it a reality is still a work in progress. Looking out from our shores, there are countries around the world that consider homosexuality a crime. In Iran, for example, gay men and women have been executed. In Nigeria, it is illegal to be in a same-sex relationship. Advocating on behalf of LGBT persons can be a crime, especially where Sharia law is practiced. And in Russia's Chechnya region, there are many reports of people being secretly abducted and tortured on suspicions that they are gay. Underground railroads have been established to secret some of them out of the country. Unfortunately, some of these people have died or have never been seen again. Horrific human rights violations have no place in this world, and the perpetrators of egregious human rights ab abuses must be held accountable. So I want to take a moment, however, to also note that protecting human rights means honoring treaties the United States has ratified and respecting all human rights as defi defined in those instruments. And that includes respecting the rights of various religious communities to live out their deeply held beliefs, which are protected under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other treaties. Just as the gay community should be protected from violence, others who subscribe to faith and science-based notions of sexuality and gender deserve to be free of bullying. In other words, everyone should be able to live without fear of persecution. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Now yield back. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Today we'll hear from two panels. Our first panelist is Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary, Mr. Scott Busby. Mr. Busby is an Acting Principal Deputy Secretary of State in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the U.S. Department of State, where he currently oversees the Bureau's work on Africa, East Asia and the Pacific, the Western Hemisphere, the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons, visas and sanctions involving human rights, and business and business and human rights. On our second panel, we will feature four private witnesses, which we will, we will introduce to you later on. Acting uh, Principal Deputy Secretary Busby, I now recognize you for your opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Ranking Member, for your powerful statements. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to testify today 
on advancing and protecting the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex persons abroad. As President Biden and Secretary Blinken have made clear, advancing the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons is a US foreign policy priority. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone is entitled to human rights and fundamental freedoms, and our work aims to ensure that LGBTQI plus persons enjoy those rights and freedoms just as everyone else should. The Department of State seeks to combat the violence, abuse, criminalization, discrimination, and stigma targeting such persons through diplomatic engagement and programmatic support in partnership with civil society. That partnership with civil society is especially critical as they know best the situation on the ground and how to advance the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons most effectively. They also bear the risk of any actions that may be taken on their behalf. Thus, our efforts are undertaken in the spirit of do no harm to ensure that these efforts do not contribute to negative repercussions for local communities. On February the 4th, President Biden issued his presidential memorandum on advancing the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons around the world, directing executive departments and agencies engaged abroad to ensure that US diplomacy and foreign assistance promote and protect the human rights of such persons. The Department of State is leading US government implementation of this guidance in coordination with relevant federal agencies. Unfortunately, while there has been some global progress in protecting the rights of LGBTQI plus persons in recent years, there also continue to be significant human rights abuses against them, including extrajudicial killings, torture, and arbitrary detention. Roughly 71 countries still criminalize LGBTQI status or conduct, and one priority of ours is to continue to seek the repeal or elimination of such laws. I refer you to my written testimony, as well as the relevant sections of our annual country reports on human rights practices for further details on our concerns in a number of countries. The US government seeks to address these concerns in a number of ways. Diplomatically, we work through bilateral and multilateral channels, raising concerns with governments publicly and privately coordinating policy messaging with like-minded countries, and consulting regularly with civil society. We also seek to hold accountable those responsible for serious abuses against LGBTQI plus persons, including through the use of economic sanctions and visa restrictions. Multilaterally, we work with like-minded governments in the UN and regional bodies. In the UN, the department supports the work of the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity and participates in the LGBTI core group in New York as well as a similar group in Geneva. The department is also a leading member of the Equal Rights Coalition, a group of 42 like-minded governments that collaborate along with civil society and foundations to advance the rights of LGBTQI plus persons globally. The State Department and USAID also provide significant amounts of foreign assistance to advance the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons. DRL's intersectional programming spans across more than 100 countries and is demand-driven and locally led. DRL also manages the Global Equality Fund, otherwise known as the GEF, a public-private partnership that receives support from numerous governments and private donors and provides emergency assistance, long-term programming, and grassroots support to organizations abroad. With generous support from Congress, in FY 2021, the department will provide $10 million to the GEF. USAID also supports the protection of LGBTQI plus persons through research and programming. USAID's multi-donor LGBTI Global Human Rights Initiative leverages partners' contributions to support programming. Through its Human Rights Grants Program, USAID responds to challenges and opportunities, and through assistance for research, USAID supports efforts to understand stigma and measure countries' persecution and protection of LGBTQI plus people. In conclusion, as we celebrate Pride 
it is important to recognize how far we have come at home and abroad in the fight for human rights of LGBTQI plus persons, while also acknowledging the distance we still have to go. Thank you and happy Pride. I welcome your comments and questions. Let me thank you for your testimony. I'm not going to recognize members for five minutes each pursuant to the House rules. And all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. I'll recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we will come back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally and identify yourself so that we know who is speaking. I will start by recognizing myself. Please note that I will be uh, enforcing the five minute rule uh, uh, to, as far as time limits for questioning to allow as many members as possible to ask questions today. And I'll ask you to be concise uh, with your, your answers. So in 2011, Secretary Clinton gave a landmark speech on human rights of LGBTQI plus people. She called on the world to protect the human rights of LGBTQI plus people. The speech was preceded by an Obama administration memorandum on international initiatives to advance the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons. The memo directed all agencies engaged abroad to ensure that the U.S. diplomacy and foreign assistance uh, promote and protect the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons. Now, I'm pleased that the Biden administration issued a similar memo in February, building upon and updating the Obama administration's memo. So my question to you is now a decade has passed since 2011 and the Obama memo and Clinton's historic speech. So what is the Biden administration doing differently to advance and protect the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons around the world? And what progress has been made since 2011 and what challenges remain ahead? Thank you for that question, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, as you probably noticed, the Biden memorandum follows on very closely to the lines of effort uh, articulated in the Obama uh, memorandum. And essentially, um, the Biden memorandum enhances a lot of those lines of effort. It calls for enhanced reporting on abuses in laws against LGBTQI plus persons. It calls for enhanced consideration of LGBTQI plus refugees and asylum seekers, including by encouraging that they be considered for what are called priority one referrals. It calls for enhanced consideration of the impact of foreign assistance on human rights, including the rights of LGBTQI plus persons. It calls for enhanced consideration of the tools to use to respond to abuses against LGBTQI plus persons, including the use of financial sanctions and visa restrictions. And lastly, and this is not a separate line of effort, but is something uh, that has been identified by the leadership in the Biden administration and that we're working on, we're paying closer attention to the situation of transgender, intersex, and gender diverse individuals. These uh, classes of people were not given as much attention in the original Obama memorandum and policy. A number of them suffer extreme levels of violence, and so we're giving them extra attention uh, in the Biden administration. Well, thank you for that. So I was pleased to hear that uh, Secretary Blinken gave chief submissions and ambassadors the authority to fly the, the, the pride flag and that he also ordered the flying of the progress flag at the State Department to acknowledge other marginalized groups within the community people of color, transgender people, and those living with or who died with, from HIV AIDS. Now, I know some have criticized flying these flags at embassies uh, and at the State Department, but for me, I see them as symbols that protect and advance human rights and demand equality, diversity, and inclusion, which all of which represent ideals and values of us as Americans. So can you describe uh, the reasons why we fly these flags and the effect that it has had 
on many of the host nations and, and, and how does the support of the U.S. embassies help in the advancement of human rights and LGBTQI plus persons abroad? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I think the flying of the pride flag and now the progress flag, which will be uh, pulled up at the State Department uh, this coming Friday. In fact, there's going to be a ceremony to that effect. I think that demonstrates our commitment to the human rights of these people. It shows the world that we are not afraid uh, of, of standing up for the rights of these people and of doing what we can to help them. So I think it's a very, very visible sign of support. That said, uh, as you noted, the Secretary has given discretion to our Chiefs of Mission as to whether to fly the flag or not. And that's because in some countries, our Chiefs of Mission may feel flying the flag is not going to advance the effort. So there is a degree of discretion uh, in when and whether the flag is flown. But as you note, uh, there is a strong commitment to flying that flag when possible to demonstrate our solidarity with this community. Well, thank you, and thank you for your answers. I will now call on members for the questioning, and I'll start with Ranking Member McCall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, and, and the Bureau on Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor for the, uh, all the fine work you do uh, as an advocate of human rights. Um, as you know, a core human right is religious freedom, and this committee has been examining human rights violations around the globe, um, but I can think of nothing uh, worse uh, than what is happening to the Uyghur Muslim population in China, uh, solely based on their uh, faith, their religion. Um, and uh, uh, can you tell uh, the committee what your bureau is doing on behalf of advancing the human rights for the Uyghur Muslim population? Thank you, uh, thank you for that question, uh, Ranking Member McCall. Um, we are doing everything we can to call attention to the horrific situation of Uyghur Muslims and other uh, Muslim minority communities in Xinjiang. Uh, first, we are describing and publicizing the various types of violations of human rights that are occurring there. Second, we're seeking to build a multilateral coalition of governments who are paying attention to this issue and doing things like imposing sanctions on both the individuals and the entities that are complicit in these human rights uh, violations. We're also uh, working as part of coalitions to call out these abuses where possible. Indeed, we just joined a joint statement at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva where we received 44 signatories to a joint statement, the most ever calling attention to the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. And can I just point out as well, um, we're working with businesses too. There are a number of products coming out of Xinjiang. Some of them are raw materials, some of them are manufactured materials, but there is an extensive amount of forced labor in Xinjiang. And one of the things we're doing is educating our business community about that forced labor, and in some cases, precluding the importation of goods that may be made with that forced labor. Well, I, I thank you for that. Tremendous work. Uh, the chairman and I um, passed out a committee, the Forced Labor Prevention Act, and as well as the Uyghur uh, Genocide Act, which would be, I think, maybe only the third time in the history of Congress to condemn under the Geneva Convention um, a country for genocide is not acceptable. Um, and I thank you, I, and I look forward to working with you more on that issue. Um, if I could turn to the Christian population, they say one out of every uh, eight nations persecutes Christians between October 2019, September 2020, more than 340 million Christians were living in countries where they suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination based on their faith. Can you address that issue? Thank you for the question. Uh, the issue of religious persecution is as important to us as any other type of human rights violation. Indeed, as you probably know, there's an office specifically dedicated to the issue of religious freedom in the State Department. And that office, uh, like our own bureau, issues its own report each year on religious persecution, human rights violation on religious grounds uh, in, involving the entire globe. Um, 
So the situation of Christians in many, many countries is horrific. It's something we call attention to, we report on, we take action on, as we do uh, the human rights abuses committed against other uh, religious minorities around the world. No, thank you. And then finally, um, in the recent conflict between Hamas and Israel, uh, we saw a lot of anti-Semitic uh, comments and tweets come out, um, which I find disturbing. My father was a bombardier in the B-17 World War II, bombed the Nazis, was part of the D-Day air campaign. That has no place uh, in our world, I believe. And yet there were the Anti-Defamation League, I met with the president, and um, there were tens of thousands of tweets that went out saying Hitler was right. Um, can you address the, this anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish uh, rhetoric? Oh, I share your revulsion uh, at that type of rhetoric. Uh, and as you probably know, we also have a special envoy specifically yeah. dedicated to the issue of anti-Semitism. We're awaiting the formal appointment of someone into that position, but a colleague of mine is currently fulfilling that role. Mm -hmm. And among other sh things, she is tracking uh, anti-Semitism as it pops up around the world, including in the Middle East, and seeking to address it. Well, thank you for the, your fine work, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize uh, Representative Bill Keating of Massachusetts, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on Europe, Energy, the Environment, and Cyber. And I also wanted to thank him for uh, holding a historic hearing uh, just a few uh, weeks ago in his subcommittee, uh, focusing in on uh, LGBTQI plus uh, and, and human rights uh, that they should have as all human beings. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this full hearing, an historic hearing uh, on this important human rights issue today uh, here in, uh, joined in, in person for change, which is uh, something that we all look forward to. Um, I joined with uh, Representative Titus in sending a letter uh, to the administration uh, with a concern that was brought up to us in, that, in the recent hearing we did have about the equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine and some indications that people in the LGBTQI uh, plus community were being discriminated against in the distribution uh, of this life-saving vaccine. Um, could you comment on what your experience is in seeing that discrimination and what the administration can do to make sure there's an equitable distribution of this life-saving vaccine? Thank you for the question, uh, Representative Keating, and for the letter. Uh, there's no question that marginalized populations like the LGBTQI plus community have suffered extensively during the COVID crisis. They've had harder access uh, to healthcare. They've had harder access to other uh, resources uh, and frankly need uh, lots of attention. Um, we are uh, both in our own approach to the COVID crisis and in our uh, diplomacy with other governments, urging them to pay attention to these types of marginalized populations. And I'm confident that our special coordinator on addressing COVID, Gail Smith, is undertaking that very effort herself. Well, thank you. In, in your written statements, you mentioned adjustments that are taking place uh, in policy and programmatic changes uh, with the State Department in uh, countries where there's backsliding of a democracy and more authoritarianism, and, and particularly uh, I'm concerned at, at how uh, people in the LGBTQI uh, plus community are used sometimes in these kind of authoritarian countries uh, to, as a way to solidify power. Can you comment on what some of those adjustments uh, would be more specifically or what you anticipate? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there's no question that there are authoritarian regimes that scapegoat LGBTQI plus persons, in part to distract from the sorts of things they're doing towards the population as a whole. But it's also true in countries like Russia that they have specifically taken action against the LGBTQI plus uh, population 
again, uh, because they view it as politically convenient, uh, perhaps. Um, we don't have any single way we approach these situations, um, but we do look to the guidance, the advice, um, the information from groups on the ground, because they're the ones living the reality day in, day out, and in our view, they are the ones that know best how to address these sorts of situations. So sometimes it might be sanctions, other times it might be assistance of various types, in other cases it might be joint statements in multilateral fora, but we look to them a great deal for guidance on how best to address these problems. You, you mentioned 71 countries that have laws on the books, uh, you know, uh, really solidifying this kind of discrimination. Uh, you know, could you give us, even with countries that have protective laws against discrimination on the books, how even is the enforcement in a lot of those countries? Because the laws are one thing, the enforcement's another. Uh, and secondly, I'm running out of time, but you can give us a country quickly that is a great example of uh, trying to instill protections uh, for this community uh, and a brighter note. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, uneven law enforcement is a huge, huge problem. There is a huge gap between uh, what the law says in any given country and then how that law is applied. So very, very difficult to say um, exactly uh, how that works. One country that I recently visited that on its own decided to do away with its anti-LGBTQI plus law uh, is Angola. Uh, there was a change of government several years in Angola uh, and the parliament reviewed its laws and they decided that the law in the books criminalizing LGBTI status should be done away with and they summarily did so. Uh, and there are, other, there are other governments that have done that sort of thing. So we applaud governments that have taken that type of action. Um, well, thank you for your service, sir. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now uh, recognize Representative Brad Sherman of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Busby. Welcome back to our uh, committee. Um, Ordinarily, we would have uh, the Assistant Secretary join us, but the Assistant Secretary has yet to be confirmed. This gives you a, uh, a second opportunity to uh, work above your pay grade, but it's my understanding that uh, this doesn't actually increase your compensation much to uh, the chagrin of, of some. Uh, I wanna praise, uh, uh, first of all, well, just having a president who uh, led the effort in our country for marriage equality uh, at such a critical way and at such a critical time sends uh, a message to the whole world. I wanna praise the Biden administration for issuing the presidential memorandum advocating uh, human rights of uh, LGBTQI plus persons around the world by issuing this memorandum just a couple of weeks after the inauguration. President Biden made it clear that this uh, it's a policy of the United States to promote uh, human rights uh, of the community uh, uh, everywhere. One of the areas to do that is multinational uh, fora and international organizations. Um, it, what has the uh, Biden administration done to date to advance these goals at the, the G7, uh, the United Nations, and other international fora? And uh, to what extent are we including uh, civil society Thank you for the question, uh, Congressman Sherman. Well, I have an example of something that we've done uh, that's quite current. Uh, we are about to host a side event at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva on the human rights of transgender persons. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in my testimony, transgender persons are among those who suffer the greatest degree of violence, but haven't always received uh, lots of attention. Uh, and we felt it was very important to highlight this issue. And thus, uh, we made the decision to hold this side event. And indeed, Secretary Blinken, Blinken is delivering remarks at this side event. At the same time, on the assistance side, we are upping our contributions to the Global Equality Fund, uh, largely as a consequence of the support provided from you all here in the Congress. But we are also uh, adding additional resources uh, to our efforts to address the emergency needs of the LGBTQI community uh, and those fighting for the rights of the LGBTQI community. 
Thank you. And as I was saying, you're doing an outstanding job, but uh, the Senate does need to uh, confirm uh, an assistant secretary, and that would be a demonstration of the Senate's uh, dedication to, uh, to human rights and to particularly the rights we're focusing on here today. Um, in Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, and a few other countries, the death penalty is imposed uh, for those engaging in consensual uh, same-sex uh, uh, relations. Um, that continues uh, to be a, a blot on, on the world's record. Uh, on the other hand, Bhutan and Garbon are among the countries that have at least decriminalized homosexuality in recent years. Uh, what countries is the State Department particularly focused on in an effort, and I realize this is just the first step in moving toward uh, uh, equal rights, but uh, in an effort to at least see uh, the decriminalization of uh, of being part of the LGBTQI community. Thanks for the question, Congressman. I agree that the uh, provision of the death penalty for people who are LGBTQI plus persons is absolutely abhorrent, uh, and we share your conviction to speak out about um, uh, that type of uh, punishment. I don't want to name particular countries, but suffice it to say that we are we have chosen a country or countries in each region of the world where we feel there's the possibility of decriminalization, and we work closely with civil society uh, in those countries as well as with our like-minded partners in trying to persuade legislators in those countries and or uh, uh, encourage the use of the courts uh, to eliminate these laws. Well, I would hope that uh, USAID would confer with you uh, before allocating uh, our scarce foreign aid dollars and development dollars. Uh, there are many uh, things that go into uh, making those decisions, but a country that is uh, moving forward and protecting human rights uh, ought to be favored, and they ought to get the information from the way they're The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ami Berra of California, who's the chair of the subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and nonproliferation for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing during Pride Month, incredibly important topics. Um, as I think about the, the region that, that I have jurisdiction over, yeah, obviously there's many LGBTQI plus um, issues and communities there that face violence and discrimination with, within the region. That said, before I talk about the challenges abroad, you know, I also want to, you know, as a senior Indian American member of Congress, um, think about some of the challenges that the various diasporas face here in the United States as well. And last week, I had a chance to, to convene a roundtable with South Asian American LGBTQI um, plus community groups and, and groups like the Desi Rainbow Parents, et cetera, to create a context where communities and diasporas that don't traditionally talk about these issues can do so in a supportive way to allow their family members um, to, to come out of the shadows and, and have productive conversations. And you know, I, I do intend to, to do more of that. And again, this Pride Month, it's incredibly important that we reaffirm our support for and celebrate the diversity of the entire LGBTQ community, including those in the South Asian community. Um, there's also, within um, my jurisdiction, some positive stories as well. You know, when I look at Taiwan, a country, um, the first country in, in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage, that's a positive story. You know, I look at a ruling that um, a judge in India uh, came out with um, earlier this month ordering government officials to create sweeping reforms to respect LGBTQI plus rights, stating that ignorance is no ju justification for normalizing any form of discrimination. And I think those are positive steps. Um, Assistant Secretary, um, Acting Assistant Secretary Busby, again, thank you for your service in making yourself readily available both to my subcommittee and, and the committee at large. What are some additional steps that we can take as you see some of these positive actions taking place um, to, to help keep moving these countries in, in the right direction and advancing the, those human rights? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman Barra. 
and thank you for your work with the uh, diaspora community. I think that's a, an interesting and probably pretty effective way of trying to change the hearts and minds of, of people not only who are here in the United States, but back in the home country uh, on these issues. Certainly to have Congress call attention uh, to the plight of the LGBTQI plus community as this hearing is doing is one thing that you can uh, continue to do. But we would urge you in your engagements with foreign governments uh, to raise these issues where there are problems in a, a particular country. And of course, the foreign assistance that you all continue to provide to us uh, and USAID to address these issues is also critically important. Great. Thank you for that. And, you know, switching subjects, um, you know, when we look at the LGBTQI community and we look at um, men who have sex with men or um, the transgender community, we recognize there's a much higher HIV rate, you know, um, 22 times higher um, in men having sex with men, 12 times higher in the transgender community. Um, in the last administration, with how they applied the global gag rule, which was broad and expansive, including um, impacting um, organizations that are very successful, like PEPFAR, um, forcing clinics to, to either close or choose not to offer, you know, really important services is, you know, I, I applaud the Biden administration for rolling um, through executive actions the, the global gag rule back. But, you know, from your perspective, um, how was the impact of how the, the Trump administration implemented the global gag rule, which, again, was more expansive than previously? Congressman, unfortunately, that uh, uh, area falls outside my jurisdiction. I don't really, uh, I'm not centrally involved in the programs uh, that were affected by the global gag rule, so I don't, I can't really comment on your question. Okay, well, I'll, so I'll put my doctor hat on, and just by limiting access to life-saving therapy um, and that expansive um, definition that the prior administration used, I think it did have a real impact to access to care life-saving care from, you know, a, a, a program that we all should be proud of with regards to PEPFAR. Well, with that, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative David Cincellini of Rhode Island, who is the author of the Global Respect Act. We thank him for that contribution. He's now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member Wolkoff for calling this historic hearing. Uh, and I really want to thank you, particularly Chairman Meeks, for your extraordinary leadership. Uh, thank you to uh, the witness on this panel and to the other witnesses we'll hear from. As the Biden administration and many members of this committee work to again center human rights as pillars of American foreign policy, this hearing affords us the opportunity to resolutely declare that the United States is prepared to lead the global effort for equality and human rights. Through hearings and legislation like the Global Respect Act and the GLOBE Act, we can raise awareness of the struggles so many face down every day, and we can put an end to the hate and persecution of millions because of who they love or how they identify. In Hungary and Poland, illiberal reactionary governments scapegoat LGBTQI persons to distract from their own failed policy, making hate a broadly accepted feature of society. In parts of Russia, LGBTQI persons are tortured or disappear only for authorities to look the other way. In Iran, LGBTQI plus persons have been murdered for who they are and the perpetrators are left unpunished. And without a concerted effort by the United States and its partners and allies, we risk not only more LGBTQI lives lost, but also risk exacerbating the decline of democracy worldwide. And so that's why this hearing is so important and why the leadership of you, Jeremy, is so critical. And so my question, uh, Mr. Busby, is first, um, uh, how would you do the enforcement of sanctions against those that commit or advocate for violence or persecution against LGBTQ plus persons help advance the goal set forth in President Biden's memorandum of February 2021, for which I and the entire community is incredibly grateful? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Representative Cicilline, and thank you for your leadership on these issues over the years. We really appreciate it. We do think sanctions are one tool, one important tool that can be used to hold accountable individuals who commit abuses against LGBTQI plus persons, but it's not the only tool. 
Uh, it is powerful. It can have a deterrent effect. Uh, but in some situations, the activists on the ground are not looking for us to take that sort of action for fear that it could target them. Uh, so in any case, I, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. We really look to our uh, colleagues on the ground, the activists in countries where there are such abuses uh, taking place. We look to them, uh, their analysis and recommendations on how best to address a particular set of, of abuses. Uh, and if they think sanctions would be appropriate, uh, we try to pursue them. Thank you. And would you speak to uh, how the State Department is ensuring that refugees and asylum seekers are able to access assistance and protection? Because we know uh, and we have seen so many stories that LGBTQI refugees and asylum seekers who are really put at risk uh, by being housed in countries that are hostile to uh, our community and uh, don't offer sufficient protection. And the second question I'll ask as part of that is, uh, when does the Biden administration intend to appoint a new special envoy for the human rights of LGBTI persons? Two uh, important but unrelated questions. Thank you for the uh, questions, Congressman. Uh, on asylum seekers and refugees, as I mentioned, uh, President Biden's memorandum specifically uh, urges consideration of use of something called a pri the priority one uh, referral category. Uh, this allows uh, our embassies to specifically refer individuals to our refugee resettlement program. And so the memorandum encourages uh, our embassies to use this authority to provide protection to LGBTQI uh, plus persons. On appointment of a special envoy, I can't uh, say more other than I think it will be very soon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and in the, the last few seconds that I have, uh, Mr. Vesey, you know, Hungary's uh, parliament has recently passed anti-LGBTQI legislation under the uh, auspices of Prime Minister Orban ahead of the upcoming elections. Is this an example in which the State Department and related agencies could pursue an appropriate response as referenced or directed in the President's memorandum uh, in February 2021? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Yes, we're very concerned by the law uh, passed in Hungary. Uh, we think it raises concerns about freedom of expression restrictions, which have no place in democratic societies. It also stigmatizes a segment of society by creating false associations with heinous crimes. Um, we have called out um, uh, uh, our concerns about um, uh, this law, um, both uh, from our embassy uh, in Hungary as well as from here in Washington, um, and we will continue to do so. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Young Kim of California, who is the vice ranking member of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Nonproliferation for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Mix, and I would also like to thank uh, Ranking Member McCall, and thank you, Secretary uh, Busby, for joining us today. As many of my colleagues have already stated, there is no denying that much of the world is a hostile place for many because of their sexual orientation. These people routinely face discrimination in some countries and live in fear in others where their identity is punishable by imprisonment or death. These are the fears of those living in those countries with the worst human rights records, mostly in Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. In some countries, including Iran, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia, homosexuality is not only criminalized, but punishable by capital punishment. But danger for these individuals does not stop at the state. In the Middle East in particular, Many individuals confirmed or suspected to be of a different sexual orientation are subject to extrajudicial killings at the hands of militias, local authorities, and even family members. All these so-called honor killings are ignored by the state. Just last month, Ali Reza Fazel Monfared, he's a 20-year-old citizen of Iran, was murdered by his own family for identifying as a gay man. Mr. Monfaret's case is not an isolated one. In countries like Iran, 
Honor killings have been allowed to run rampant and lead to murder of an untold number of women, girls, and individuals from vulnerable populations. For these reasons, I was happy to partner with Congressman Cicilline in introducing a resolution today condemning Iran for allowing honor killings in its country to go unpunished and calling of the international community to hold the regime accountable for its human rights abuses. There is a unifying theme between these abuses. Those countries who perpetrate the worst abuses towards those disadvantaged by their sexual orientation also generally have the worst records on human rights abuses overall. With regular abuses and atrocities directed at vulnerable population for their political views, religious beliefs, and ethnicity. The perpetrators of these abuses are not isolated from the international arena or stigmatized as untouchable. Many of them sit in seats of international power, with a number of them, including China, Russia, Cuba, Saudi Arabia, Eritrea, Malawi, Pakistan, Somalia, Senegal, Sudan, and Venezuela, even sitting on the UN Human Rights Council. China is committing genocide against entire ethnic groups as we speak and sits on one of the five permanent members on the UN Security Council. UNHCR even went so far as to praise Iran last year in a joint report for its progress on modernizing and humanitarian issues. This is the international body supposed to highlight and governed human rights issues internationally, and it's praising the worst violators. Secretary Busby, how can we credibly leverage the influence of the United States and other international organizations to protect the basic rights of those at risk for their sexual orientation when we can't even hold regimes with horrible human rights records towards general populations accountable? Further, how will you work within the State Department to ensure that it is the United States policy that the worst human rights abusers are removed from seats of influence on deciding human rights issues such as UNHCR? Thank you for the questions, uh, Congresswoman. We share your concern about the situations you describe and the abuses uh, that you describe as well in those countries, horrific. And it is indeed quite challenging to address these. Um, I think the view of the Biden administration is that while indeed there are significant problems in multilateral bodies like the Human Rights Council, that our engaging in those bodies is ultimately going to be more effective in advancing our goals than pulling out of them. And that's indeed why we re-engaged with the Council soon after President Biden took office and why we've decided to run for a seat on the Human Rights Council again. And I think this reflects a fundamental view of the Biden administration, is that to make progress on these issues, whether it's with a particular country or a multilateral institution, we need to be working with our like-minded partners. The more we can partner with other governments that share our values, the greater impact uh, I think we can have. Recently, on March 22nd, uh, we declared sanctions uh, with the EU, UK, and Canada on a number of Chinese individuals and entities implicated in the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. we, uh, that's elicited a very strong reaction from the PRC, which we think demonstrates that they are concerned about their reputation uh, internationally. Uh, and we think the more that countries can join together to express their concerns, the greater that these countries may listen to what we have to say. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. The gentlelady's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global Corporate Social Impact for five minutes. Uh, well, thank you, Chairman Meeks, for this uh, very historic hearing. Uh, our nation's foreign policy in this committee should do more to break the divide between issues that we consider to be domestic issues and those that we consider to be foreign policy issues. And this hearing is a wonderful example of this Congress in this term doing that. Uh, 
And so I know that David asked a question about asylum seekers, and I wanted to ask a follow-up to that about how they're treated or the protections that they're afforded while they're waiting for their asylum cases. A recent study by UCLA School of Law estimated that between 2012 and 2017, 11,400 people sought asylum in the United States on the basis of their LG, LGBTQI plus status. Of these asylum seekers, more than half came from the Northern Triangle. Uh, LGBTQI plus rights in these countries are in many ways uh, getting worse. Uh, I appreciate that last week, the Biden administration reversed Trump administration policies that limited asylum for those fleeing for domestic violence and gang threats that disproportionately affect this community. Despite that, the Biden administration has also asked asylum seekers to stay in Central America and apply for asylum there in a place where they remain vulnerable. And so my question is, what is the administration doing to ensure that LGBTQI plus asylum seekers are protected while their asylum claims are being processed? Thank you for the very good question, uh, Congressman. Uh, first of all, let me say that issues of asylum are outside the State Department's jurisdiction. Those are issues uh, that the Department of Justice and Department of Homeland Security are uh, responsible for. That said, the way in which the State Department can contribute to addressing these issues is through our reporting. And indeed, in our annual country reports on human rights practices, we have a section specifically dedicated uh, to uh, reporting on the abuses against LGBTQI plus persons. Uh, we're gonna do our best to enhance that reporting. That reporting then becomes critical in the adjudication of asylum cases. Uh, indeed, both asylum officers and immigration judges, I know, look very much to these country reports that we generate to assess these claims. So that's the way in which we in DRL and we at the State Department are trying to help address that problem. No, well, and thank you for your work on that. And I certainly hope that our diplomatic corps, our diplomats, will raise these issues in these nations and let them know that we're watching on this. And uh, let me follow up with one more question I think I have time for. Uh, in 2018, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights ruled that the 20 member states of the American Convention on Human Rights are obligated to legalize same-sex marriage. Despite this, we haven't seen much momentum to implement the ruling outside of Costa Rica and Ecuador. What is the State Department doing to push other countries in the Western Hemisphere to, to provide marriage equality to same-sex couples, especially members of the, of the American Convention on Human Rights? Thanks for the question, Congressman. We do not advocate for or against same-sex marriage overseas. And that's because it is still an unsettled question in lots of countries and in international law. Um, we have decided to dedicate our efforts primarily to protecting and promoting the core rights of LGBTQI plus persons, such as the right to life, the right to be free of torture, the right to be free from arbitrary detention. So for now, uh, we do not uh, advocate one way or the other overseas uh, on same-sex marriage. Okay, thank you for that. I yield back. Mr. Castro yields back. I now recognize Representative Dina Titus of Nevada, who is the author of The Greater Leadership Overseas for the Benefit of Equality, also known as the GLOBE Act. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for mentioning the GLOBE Act. It certainly fits right in with today's hearing. And again, like so many others, I commend you for having this hearing because it's the first time the full committee has addressed this issue, and yet it's such an important one. It also builds on a hearing that uh, Chairman Keating had in the European subcommittee where we heard that democratic backsliding and COVID had both uh, exacerbated the problem of discrimination from the LGBTI plus uh, community. So it, it's certainly timely and uh, thank you again for doing that. You know, the, if I can just take a minute of uh, 
personal indulgence to talk a little bit about the GLOBE Act is to restore the U.S. position internationally as a leader in protecting human rights for everybody around the globe. And in the last four years the, of the Trump administration, we saw the loss of or the throwing out of some of the gains that had been made under President Obama. I'm glad to see that we are returning to a situation where the administration feels that this should be a priority. We heard Secretary Blinken just uh, this week addressing an organization about trans uh, rights and making it very clear that the U.S. State Department will make this a part of our foreign policy. But some of the things that the GLOBE Act does specifically are endorse the use of sanctions against those that commit human rights abuses. This is also outlined in Mr. Cicilline's bill, the Global Respect Act, and we've worked together on this and I commend his leadership. It ensures that foreign assistance and health programs are tied to uh, inclusivity for LGBTI plus populations like the vaccine. Let's be sure everybody gets the vaccines when we give them to certain countries. Um, decriminalizing LGBTI status in our rule of law programs, ensuring fair access for asylum and refugee programs, and just calling for U.S. leadership and multilateral cooperation. So that's the direction we need to go, and I think we are doing that. I would ask you, Mr. Busby, though, for some specifics. We heard Secretary Blinken make a promise to create the special envoy for human rights for LGBTI plus persons, uh, but that still remains unfilled. And I wonder what kind of progress is being made in filling that position. Also, if you look at the budget, there are some references to LGBTI uh, rights, but it's unclear how much financial assistance will go in that area or just how much of a priority it will be. So could you address us about what the policies are being put in place? Will there be an envoy? Will there be enough resources in your budget to accomplish some of these goals? And how you're going to work with the other international organizations to be sure that it's not just talk, but it actually results in action. Well, thank you for the questions, Congresswoman, and thank you for your commitment to addressing these issues. Uh, that type of attention, I think, really does uh, make a difference. Um, first of all, as to the Special Envoy, Secretary Blinken indeed has committed to filling that slot, and as I said earlier, uh, I expect the slot will be filled very uh, soon. Um, as for uh, financial assistance, uh, we have upped the level of our contributions at the State Department uh, to the Global Equality Fund uh, this uh, uh, fiscal year. Um, you all appropriated to us $10 million for that purpose, and we will be contributing that um, plus some. Um, so we are upping the level of our assistance uh, dedicated to these issues, um, as is USAID. And then how best to collaborate with international organizations on these issues. I think it does help to have a person or entity specifically uh, devoted to looking at and working on these issues. That's why the Human Rights Council created an independent expert devoted uh, to these issues. But as I said earlier, I think it's also super important for us to be collaborating with like-minded countries in addressing problems in particular countries and seeking to ensure that all multilateral organizations pay attention to these issues. Thank you, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, letting us move forward with the GLOBE Act and having this as a priority for this committee. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. I now uh, recognize Representative Susan Weil of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Busby, my first question actually isn't going to be a question. I had wanted to ask you about Hungary's new law targeting the LGBTQ community, which I believe Mr. Cicilline asked you about, um, that law blocking the use of content depicting same-sex relationships or gender identity issues in any material being shown to minors under the age of 18, including in 
crucial services such as sex education programs in schools. But I'm going to refrain from asking that question because I'm not sure that we in the United States at this point can claim a superior position on that issue, at least in some states, particularly given that we are starting to hear from our friends across the aisle, even about teaching um, on issues of race. So uh, with that, I will note that several of Hungary's um, fellow EU members, including Germany and France, have begun speaking out against the law, and I commend them for that. Um, but I'll move on to a real question, and that is um, about Brazil. I, early on in my time in Congress, I met with John Willis, Brazil's first openly gay member of Congress, who was forced to resign his seat and leave the country because of mounting <laughs> credible death threats in the wake of the election of the homophobic and xenophobic current president, Jair Bolsonaro. Since then, um, multiple members of the same opposition party, many of them Afro-Brazilian, as well as members or close allies of the LGBTQ community have been targeted as well. For instance, Taleria Patron, who had to leave her own district and go into hiding because of fears for her and her child. These elected officials have not received adequate protection from the Brazilian government, and three years after the assassination of Mara Eli Franco, an outspoken Afro-Brazilian gay member of Rio's city council, those who ordered her assassination still have not been brought to justice. So with all of that as backdrop, my question to you is, how does the administration intend to engage with Brazil on these very homophobic actions and statements of its president um, which have been well documented. I'm not going to dignify them by repeating them here, but I, I'd love to know how the administration intends to engage with Brazil on this. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman. Woman. Um, we do recognize that LGBTQI plus persons in Brazil, particularly transgender and other gender diverse persons and persons of African descent are at heightened risk of and experience violence, discrimination, and stigma. I would also note that the rate of murders of transgender persons in Brazil has also gone up quite dramatically in recent years. I'm sure we're raising our concerns privately. Beyond that, I don't have much detail, so let me get back to you with uh, more details on what we're doing in Brazil. I appreciate that, and most of all, what I'd like to hear is a commitment um, by the administration that it will use its best efforts um, to engage with Brazil on this and more specifically to convey its concerns and um, uh, displeasure with, with this position. You have that commitment, Congresswoman. Thank you very much. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. General Lady yields back. I now recognize Representative Dean Phillips of Minnesota for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. and. I think most know the House Foreign Affairs Committee was established in 1822, almost 200 years ago. And this is the very first full committee hearing dedicated to LGBTQI rights. And I'm honored to be a participant and so grateful to our witnesses for shedding light on the important and necessary work that we all need to do to support our LGBTQI community all around the world. Uh, my question, Mr. Busby, is uh, democracies clearly appear to be doing a better job protecting rights of the LGBTQI community uh, more than autocratic governments, I think it's fair to say. So how can the U.S. ensure that foreign assistance uh, that's focused on promoting civil society advocacy and the rule of law and democracy more generally also be protecting the human rights of LGBTQI persons? Thanks for the question, uh, Congressman. Um, as part of the Equal Rights Coalition, something I mentioned in my testimony, mm -hmm. which is a group of like-minded governments seeking to advance the rights of LGBTQI plus persons uh, overseas, there's a coordinating committee there that's specifically focused on the issue of foreign assistance. And in that committee, we're talking to one another about how to ensure that our collective resources are best directed to the problems where they are most pressing. I should say as well that the Global Equality Fund, which my bureau administers, also is a multi-donor fund. And through that fund, we also seek to collectively identify where the problems, where the needs are the greatest, 
and try to address them with the foreign assistance we have. And, and how would you grade progress to that end so far with that initiative? I think when it comes to foreign assistance, we've made great uh, progress, um, uh, both in providing emergency assistance to individual and groups under threat, but also providing assistance to groups who are advocating for the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons. There's always more to be done. Not, nothing is per perfect, and indeed, in our world, there continue to be far too many abuses against LGBTQI plus persons. But I do think uh, we have helped to foster a very robust civil society community mm -hmm. that is committed to advancing the rights of LGBTQI plus persons. I appreciate that. Uh, and how are U.S. agencies broadly adapting their programs to fit you know, local contexts, which are, of course, uh, different in every country uh, and different conditions? And to what extent are state and other U.S. agencies reaching out to LGBTQI populations in country to help inform them of programs uh, and to ascertain and listen to their perspectives? Uh, a very good question, uh, Congressman, and indeed, the President's executive order, a presidential memorandum, actually calls on us to consult with local communities in, uh, you know, directing our uh, foreign assistance. So that is part of what both we at the State Department, we in DRL at the State Department, and USAID are, are doing as much as okay. we possibly can, talking to people on the ground to understand what their needs are so that we can best address them. And lastly, Mr. Busby, uh, are, are there any countries, any um, allies of ours that are doing work in this area, uh, perhaps better than we are, or uh, ways that we can learn from them? Any best practices amongst our peers? Well, I think we're doing pretty good work, Congressman. Uh, but I would say that the Scandinavian countries uh, are very, very committed to making progress on these issues. They are strong contributors and participants in our Global Equality Fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're doing lots of good work with them there. there. Uh, the UK is also very committed on these issues, and indeed the UK and Argentina are currently co-chairs of the Equal Rights Coalition. Together, uh, they are working well to move the ball on these issues. And are there any peers of ours that we might need to encourage? Uh, there are certainly some out there. I, I decline to identify them here in a public forum. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, sir. With that, I, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, who is the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, and thank you so much for hosting this historic hearing. Mr. Busby, I want to ask about the links between authoritarianism and violations of LGBTQIA plus people's rights. The ILGA's Europe's annual report identified 19 countries in Europe where political or religious leaders used anti-gay hate speech in 2020. Many of these countries like Hungary, Belarus, Poland are also experiencing democratic backsliding and growing authoritarianism. What do you see as the leadership, um, as the relationship between authoritarianism and this kind of hate speech? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I do think there's a link between authoritarianism and abuse of LGBTQI plus rights. In a lot of cases, it's scapegoating. Uh, these governments like to distract attention from their repressive practices by stigmatizing the LGBTQI uh, community, by blaming them uh, for certain problems. And it's also a way of trying to whip up additional support for their governments, even though they may not, in fact, be as popular as they claim to be. And how does the United States communicate to leaders in these countries that uh, provoking violence against the LGBTQIA plus communities is unacceptable? Um, well, we, we often do so privately, where we identify concerns in a given country. Our diplomats on the ground will approach the government to express our concerns. But in some situations, we will speak out. We will issue a statement uh, from our embassy. In some cases, we'll issue a statement from Washington. And in some of the most extreme cases, we will join with other like-minded countries to issue a statement in a forum like the Human Rights Council in Geneva. 
And do you feel like there is uh, a connection between um, some of the uh, religious organizations here in the United States and the work that they are doing in some of these European countries and in some African countries in advancing anti-gay uh, hate? Congresswoman, I don't know enough about what uh, the groups based in this country are doing, so I can't really comment on that question. Uh, during the previous administration, I was made aware of numerous cases of LGBTQIA plus peoples being deported to countries where they face likely repression and violence because of who they are. What are we doing to offer specific protections um, to these refugees and asylum seekers? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the, in President Biden's memorandum, there is a line of activity specifically dedicated to LGBTQI plus refugees and asylum seekers. And in that item of the presidential memorandum, the president calls on the executive branch to use its authorities to a greater extent to identify and provide protection to LGBTQI plus persons, particularly through something called priority one referrals, which are something our embassies can use to identify uh, individuals who may be LGBTQI plus and face persecution. So that's one way we can do it overseas. Domestically, that's outside the jurisdiction of the State Department. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we're trying to do is enhance our reporting on the human rights abuses against LGBTQI plus persons overseas because our reporting is crucial to the ways in which these cases are adjudicated here in the United States. Appreciate that. Um, I know you earlier said uh, you, you, you didn't know about any religious groups here in the United States that are doing work, but there's obviously uh, a documented one in Uganda where our churches here in the United States have gone to Uganda to advocate for anti-gay laws. Um, and we know that the refugee camp in, um, in Uganda, Kakuma, uh, has experienced um, uh, an uptick in, in violence when, when it comes to um, LGBTQIA plus um, refugees. Is there something that we can do to communicate with uh, international agencies uh, that are working in these refugee camps um, to, you know, make sure that there is no persecution um, for uh, these refugees for who they are? Thanks for the question, Congresswoman. We indeed are communicating with UNHCR, the primary international agency working with refugees, uh, to ensure that they are paying adequate attention to issues involving LGBTQI plus persons. And indeed, in Kenya, there recently have been some incidents, one involving some fires in a refugee camp uh, aimed at LGBTQI plus persons, and with UNHCR, uh, we're doing our utmost to address that, that sort of problem partly by moving people out of harm's way in those situations, but we are working hand in glove with UNHCR on that problem. I am pleased to hear that. Thank you. With that, I yield back. General Lady's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Jerry Connolly of Virginia, who is the President of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. I thank the Chair and welcome Mr. Busby. Um, Mr. Busby, uh, does, is it the policy of the State Department to provide explicit guidance with respect to LGBTQ rights as such to our ambassadors, consuls general, and the like with respect to representations they might make to host governments on this issue? Um, or, is it, or is it part of a general guidance on human rights advocacy? I would say it's part of our, the general guidance we provide to our embassies. Um, in our uh, instructions uh, that uh, we issue to generate our human rights reports, there is a specific section dedicated to abuses against LGBTQI persons. And in our instructions, uh, they clarify exactly the sorts of things our embassies should be looking at. Um, as well, in the lead up to Pride, we send out a cable to our uh, embassies, urging them to celebrate pride and describing the various ways in which they might do that uh, and the sorts of issues uh, we want them to sort of highlight and the sorts of issues we may not want them to uh, highlight uh, quite as much. So, and, Thank you. And, and 
where we encounter um, actual laws in host countries that criminalize homosexuality or homosexual behavior, what is the guidance we provide our foreign service officers, ambassador on down, with respect to U.S. Represent, representation on those issues? Our primary guidance to them is to talk to the advocates on the ground who are trying to change those laws. Because in our view, those advocates know best what is likely to be most effective and what is likely to be least harmful to them uh, in those efforts. So the first thing we urge them to do is to sit down with those civil society organizations and get their views and advice. Isn't there some risk, however, in countries that have criminalized this behavior that in doing that approach, which certainly is a sensitive approach and makes sense normally, that we may unwittingly put people at risk? Thanks for the question, uh, Congressman. Um, uh, we, t we urge our embassy to operate uh, as, as carefully as they can. Um, in most situations, it's okay for them to meet with these people, but uh, they will oftentimes have a sense of whether or not it will put people at risk to bring them into our embassy or to even meet with them. And those, of course, are very tough situations. And to be clear about your answer, you weren't suggesting that we don't make a representation directly government to government with respect to laws that criminalize status or behavior? Not at all, Congressman. In most of those cases, we are directly communicating with governments to urge them to change those laws. But then in terms of the overall strategy right. for changing them, we do like to partner with civil society. So final question on my time. What what particular challenge is posed by allied nations, including NATO members, who are demonizing LGBT rights um, within their own societies? For example, one that's pretty public right now is a dispute now emerging between the government of Hungary and the EU over the whole issue of gay rights and the demonization of gay and lesbian individuals for presumably political gain by the governing party. Um, what, how are we handling that challenge? Because these are allied nations. Thanks for the good question, Congressman. As I mentioned earlier, we have publicly expressed our concern about the recently passed law in Hungary, and we think what it does is entirely inappropriate. It's based largely on a similar, similar law in Russia, which we also uh, criticize. But in addition to uh, publicly expressing our concern, we are privately raising our concerns with that government as well. And other governments? Uh, uh, Hungary, is, uh, Hungary does not stand alone in the hostility of the ruling go government with respect to LGBTQ communities. No, you're right, Congressman. <laughs> it, it does not. And in those situations, again, it, it's situation specific. I would say uh, where they are allies of ours, we do go privately into those governments and express our concerns when they do things, we, things which we think. Thank you, fine. Mr. Busby. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Ted Deutsch of Florida, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for calling this critical hearing the first ever at the full committee level to specifically address the issues facing the LGBTQI plus community. Uh, and as vice chair and one of several members of the Congressional LGBTQ Equality Caucus on, on this committee, I also want to specifically acknowledge and commend the leadership of our uh, colleague uh, and uh, chair of the Equality Caucus, Mr. Cicilline. Um, and I, I just would take a moment to note my dismay that at a hearing entitled Advancing and Protecting LGBTQI Plus Rights Abroad, uh, the absence of uh, members on the other side of the aisle uh, is, is really dismaying. As I said just days ago at our Europe subcommittee hearing on this topic, uh, I'm proud to be part of the effort to stand up for equality and human rights uh, for the LGBTQI plus community all over the world, not just during Pride Month, but always. This hearing, like the subcommittee hearing earlier this month, demonstrates that this committee and this Congress 
knows that the right of every person to have equal opportunity, regardless of gender or sexual orientation, regardless of who they love or their gender presentation, is an unequivocal part of our nation's human rights vision and foreign policy. And after four years of an administration that not only sidelined LGBTQI plus rights in its foreign policy, but actively, actively moved backward for the community, I was proud to see the Biden administration's memorandum earlier this year that enshrined the advancement of global LGBTQI plus rights in U.S. policy and proud to be part of U.S. government that promises to lead by the power of our, of our example. I am grateful to you, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Busby, for being here today to discuss the administration's efforts, its progress so far, and plans moving forward. Uh, and I, I wanted to focus on uh, well, certainly in the final months of the Trump administration, an issue that I had deep concerns about was the Commission on Unalienable Rights, a commission within the State Department that promoted a harmfully narrow definition of human rights from which the LGBTQI plus community was conspicuously absent. I know the administration believes differently. I know it shares my belief that human rights are universal and that a definition of human rights that excludes LGBTQI plus people is antithetical to America's ideals and leaves marginalized people around the world more vulnerable to persecution and abuse. And I'm glad uh, that Secretary Blinken repudiated the Commission's views. But the Biden administration also faces the significant challenge of rebuilding a State Department that, as recently as seven months ago, politicized human rights and prioritized certain rights over others. So I would just ask uh, if you could speak to the steps that the State Department is uh, planning to take to rebuild America's credibility on the world stage as a defender of all human rights, especially LGBTQI plus rights. Thank you for the good and difficult question, Congressman. Um, as Secretary Blinken has made clear, um, he views uh, rights as indivisible and as co-equal. And he's made that clear publicly and made that clear uh, to us in the State Department. Uh, so that message has been loud and clear. I do think our engagement internationally on these issues has increased tremendously. I think the early decision to re-engage with the Human Rights Council and then to announce uh, our decision to try to rejoin the Council was a significant one in terms of demonstrating our commitment globally to human rights. But I also think the work that we're doing domestically is absolutely critical. And the work that you all are doing here in the Congress is very, very critical. Because it's as much uh, how we serve as a model to the world that influences the world as it is what we are saying to the world. So I uh, urge you on in your efforts to make the reforms here to improve respect for human rights in the United States. Uh, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Busby. And, um, uh, really, really grateful for your work for the administration's dedication to these issues. And Mr. Chair, before I yield, I, I just want to say, as we discuss these issues, particularly the health and social well-being of the LGBTQI plus community, that the importance of global sexual and reproductive health and rights for this community cannot be overstated. The right of all people to make informed decisions about their bodies and their lives is integral to our discussion today. It is critical for members of the LGBTQI plus community to have access to comprehensive and safe and inclusive sexual and reproductive health services, including contraception and abortion. In too many cases, stigma and discrimination at clinics and refusal to provide services or referrals for life-saving treatments can have devastating consequences for LGBTQI plus individuals who should be able to access these services regardless of who they are or whom they love. For our global health agenda to be successful, U.S. policy must prevent and combat discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation in reproductive health care as well. And um, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to commend you for holding this hearing. Uh, it's incredibly important says a lot about you and your leadership, our partnership with the administration to advancing human rights for all. And I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Andy Levin of Michigan, who is the vice chair of the subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and nonproliferation for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm piling on in my gratitude and appreciation for you and holding this historic hearing. It's, it's an honor to be part of it. Uh, Mr. Busby, experts agree that violence and discrimination against LGBTQI plus persons are often rooted in societal attitudes of stigma and prejudice. 
and polling data indicate that societal acceptance of LGBTQI plus persons remains low in many countries, particularly in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Do the State Department or other U.S. departments and agencies have a role in attempting to bolster societal support for human rights of LGBTQI plus persons overseas? And if yes, how can this be accomplished? A very good question, uh, Congressman. Yes, I do think we have a role to play, primarily in assisting the civil society organizations that are seeking to change those societal um, attitudes. I know that in some countries in East Asia, for instance, there are the equivalent of uh, PFLAG organizations, uh, that is, parents uh, and family members of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals who are seeking to promote uh, tolerance and understanding. So I do think there are efforts there. I do think uh, our public diplomacy efforts as well um, are important. We should model best behavior uh, in this regard. But I do think working with civil society organizations on the ground, religious leaders, uh, is probably the most effective way to change societal attitudes. Well, outstanding and, and keep it up in that that blends right into my next question. You mentioned earlier the indivisibility of rights. The UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of a Religion or Belief last year rejected arguments that religious beliefs justify violence or discrimination against LGBTQI plus persons. He made the point that, and I'm quoting, the right to freedom of religion protects individuals and not religions as such, and that quoting, LGBT plus people experience discrimination and violence inflicted in the name of religion by state and non-state actors that impedes their ability to enjoy their human rights, including their right to freedom of religion or belief. So would you agree that the State Department should continue its work in support of religious freedom abroad and that this work is not inconsistent with the with the support of human rights for LGBTQI plus persons? Thank you for the Thank good you. question, uh, Congressman. Yes, very much agree. Again, given that our view is that rights are co-equal and indivisible, our work overseas uh, includes uh, religious freedom, uh, pressing for the rights of LGBTQI plus persons, pressing any of the human rights uh, found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we don't think there's inherent a contradiction uh, among those rights. Well, I just think your work to lift up the rights of LGBTQI plus persons in all areas of the world, regardless of what religions are prevalent there, is hugely important. And uh, it helps in this country, too, to realize that all people deserve full rights and that people can practice their beliefs, personal beliefs, and as well as have their rights, um, you know, as individuals. Finally, let me ask you this. Um, you know that in general, democracies seem to do a better job of protecting the rights of LGBTQI plus persons than do more autocratic governments, although we obviously are not perfect. We're an example of that as we struggle to get the Equality Act passed through the Senate. How do efforts to promote the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons relate to broader democracy promotion policy? How do you work those two together um, in your work abroad, around the world? Uh, another very good question, uh, Congressman. Uh, we do like to situate the work we're doing uh, to promote the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons in broader context. So we often will do work with other marginalized populations at the same time as we're working on uh, the rights of LGBTQI plus persons. So um, I agree with you that I think the treatment of LGBTQI plus persons in a given society is a barometer uh, of the general human rights and democracy situation in that country, and we need to deal with them all together uh, in addressing the problems in such a country. Outstanding. It looks like my time's expired. We're here to partner with you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Abigail Spanberger of Virginia, who is the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Europe, Energy, and the Environment and Cyber, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Busby, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my first question is a bit of a follow-up to Mr. Levins. In your answer to him, you spoke a little bit about uh, how the U.S. State Department can assist civil society organizations to change societal attitudes. Um, and I'd like to speak a little bit or ask you a little bit about human rights reporting um, and the constructive role of diplomacy in kind of that type of accountability. Um, I'm curious if you could comment what your experiences have been um, when we, the United States, report on human rights abuses, we advocate through our diplomacy um, for LGBTQI rights, and, and have you seen these efforts change particular behaviors of of governments, the, the accountability side a little bit more than, than the engagement side is what I'm asking about. Thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman. Um, it's remarkable to me how much most governments care about what goes into our human rights reports. We oftentimes will get lobbied before the re reports come out and then after the reports come out by governments who are concerned about how they will be depicted there. So I do think that reporting uh, is something that they pay attention to, and I do think in some cases it does lead to change behavior. And, and with, that, with that lobbying, it, it, what are some of the reasons either explicitly that have been advised to you or your assessments? Um, what, what does that mean to a country in terms of how we report on their treatment of LGBTQI individuals or how we report on, on their human rights uh, practices? Um, it, you know, it affects their reputation globally. Um, we produce the most comprehensive, the most detailed human rights reports in the world. I think they are generally viewed as credible. Uh, so when we identify abuses in a given country of any type, um, I think a country feels like its reputation uh, is at stake. Uh, uh, similarly, when we and other governments call out a country in uh, a context like the Human Rights Council or the UN in New York, I think there too, countries do care about how they are seen by the rest of the world and that that can lead to change behavior. Thank you very much for that. I, I think in what I understand in, in your statement is the real role and the value of US leadership and how our engagement, our efforts at accountability and certainly our diplomacy matters in the world uh, and how it in fact can change behavior, particularly as it relates to the treatment of LGBTQI individuals um, within the greater context of human rights. Um, so, so given that, less than a month into his presidency, President Biden put out a White House memorandum on advancing LGBTQI rights around the world. And so I'd like just uh, your impressions and understanding of how this memo is received internationally throughout the world. I think it's uh, been very favorably received, certainly within the U.S. Uh, executive branch, but also globally uh, when I talk to my counterparts and other governments, I think they welcome the attention uh, we've given to the issue. And I think this is demonstrated in part by the continued commitment of many governments to things like the Global Equality Fund. Uh, the amount of contributions to that fund has actually increased uh, since its founding. And I think that's testament to the ways in which uh, our government has spoken up on these issues. And how has this type of leadership or the president's um, efforts in this memorandum, how has this impacted the workforce within the United States State Department um, and the on the ground rank and file work of our diplomats throughout the world? The main impact I've seen is that where, there, where problems crop up, be it in Uganda, in Ghana, in Hungary, we are now convening small emergency task force, if you will, involving all the key people uh, with an interest in what's going on in that country. People from my bureau, people from the relevant regional bureau in the State Department, and of course, people from within our embassy on the ground in those countries. And we are uh, getting together quickly by phone. In some cases, uh, we have interagency meetings that are quickly convened to try and aggressively address the issue. So that's the main change I've seen since the memorandum came into effect. 
Thank you very much. Mr. Busby, I appreciate your time. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate this uh, excellent hearing, and, and I appreciate Mr. Busby's comments and answers to my questions, but also in his previous discussion related to democratic backsliding, the, um, the fact that we can utilize um, the treatment of LGBTQI individuals as a bit of a barometer in, in certain places throughout the world. Um, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady, each time has expired. I now recognize Representative Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you very much, Mr. Bis Bis Busby, for coming to join us today. I also want to echo my appreciation for having this hearing at this scale uh, in the foreign affairs uh, world for the first time. I'm also, however, really saddened that for my state, my Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it's hard for me to sit up here and criticize other nations for their lack of support for the LGBTQI community when my own state uh, has really got a long way to go in that area. Uh, so with that, I actually only have one question or sort of investigation with you. I wanted to talk about the intersection of advancing LGBTQI plus rights and the gender equity work that we're doing. Uh, through the Ambassador at Large and Office of Global Women's Issues, the State Department has a dedicated official that is committed to promoting the rights and empowerment of women and girls through our U.S. foreign policy. Unfortunately, despite the broad mandate of the office, the Office of Global Women's Issues has played a very limited role in addressing major human rights challenges, including access to sexual and reproductive health and rights attention to women and girls who are of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. Uh, this is somewhat along the lines of some of the questions of my colleagues. You mentioned that the Office of Global Women's Issues uh, in your written testimony, and you noted that the office plays a role in mainstreaming LGBTQI plus issues into policy priorities across the department. I was wondering if you might be able to provide us some more details on the role that that office would play, will play, and how your office will work with them to incorporate the concerns of the lesbian, bis uh, bisexual, trans, and queer women into its work. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Let me say in general terms that we work very closely with the Women's Office, indeed hand in glove. We are implementing some of the programs that they help to set up. Similarly, we look to them for guidance on how to best engage uh, the women's community uh, on a lot of these issues. In terms of specific activities that they might undertake to address the issues of lesbians, queer women, et cetera, I need to get back to you on that. I'm not aware of specific things that they're doing, but I'm sure that they, again, we are working hand in glove with them on any number of issues, both on LGBTQ plus I rights, as well as uh, women's issues. I would really very much appreciate that opportunity to delve deeper into that. Uh, I think it really deserves more attention and more detail, and um, I, would I would yield back the balance of my time, but thank you. General Ladies yields back. I now recognize Representative Tom Melanowski of New Jersey, who is the Vice Chair of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, earlier on in the, the hearing, Mr. Sherman uh, complained that we don't have a confirmed Assistant Secretary for the DRL Bureau in this hearing, and that's wrong. We have me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to register a protest there. Uh, it's good to, good to see you, Mr. Busby, um, and great that we are having this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding it. Um, I, I'm very, uh, very glad that Mr. McCall had joined you at the, the start. He's a, he's a good man, and, 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 and we love to work with him, but I do want to echo the, the concern about the empty seats on, on the other side. This should be a bipartisan issue. It shouldn't be hard, even if we may not agree on every aspect of it. Mr. Busby, uh, just first a general question. This is such a tough issue. There's so many problems around the world. Sometimes it seems as if we're just, um, uh, you know, we're, 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 that we're helpless uh, in, in the face of all of these terrible abuses. I, I just wonder if you could maybe offer a couple of examples of uh, where the work we have done uh, as, uh, as a country through this diplomacy actually has uh, reversed setbacks to LGBT rights in countries around the world. You're allowed to go back to the time when we were working on this together, uh, but I'd be curious if there are any other recent cases. Uh, I was thinking of Uganda, for example, a few years ago. 
thank you, Congressman, uh, for the good question. Yes, indeed, in Uganda in 2014, when the Ugandan legislature in the middle of the night passed a bill that would have enhanced penalties against LGBTQI plus persons, uh, the U.S. government responded quite quickly through private diplomacy and eventually some sanctions against some of the doctors involved in the uh, examination of some of the individuals accused of being LGBTQI. And indeed, that did lead to uh, that legislation being withdrawn. Right. So that's a, a good example of success. In recent years, uh, we've had success in Belize uh, with litigation there that has resulted in uh, decriminalization. We have uh, worked closely with civil society in Botswana where there have been uh, positive uh, 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 legal decisions. And as I mentioned in Angola, where there was a change of government, we have uh, reinvigorated a human rights dialogue that was actually started under your te tenure. Uh, but with the new government ang in Angola, uh, they summarily repealed uh, legislation criminalizing um, LGBTQI right. status or conduct. So that the diplomacy can work as hard as it is. So let me let me put a very tough case before you, and that is Egypt. Um, I I assume you would agree that the CC government is is systematically closing the space for LGBTQI uh, activists in the country. Um, I mean, there are horrific practices. You know, we, we know that in Egyptian prisons there are designated morality wards, as they call them, where members of the community are beaten, tortured, forced to sign statements that they were, quote, practicing debauchery. Um, you know about the case of Sarah Hagazi, of course, who had been tortured in an Egyptian prison and eventually committed suicide. Uh, I mean, this is probably one of the worst examples in the world of just utter brutality waged by a government against its LGBTQ community. Would you agree with that? We are very concerned about the abuses we've seen against the LGBTQ. Would you agree there are the level of seriousness that I specified? Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, the administration is now considering whether or not to um, withhold uh, a certain share of the military aid to Egypt that is conditioned on human rights progress. You have the, the legal authority to, to waive those conditions. Um, are, are, would this issue, these abuses specifically, be considered as part of that review? Yes, I'm sure that these issues will be among those considered in that review. Understood. Have, have we ever raised the, the, the specific brutality against the LGBTQ community with senior Egyptian officials? Um, was it raised with Abbas Kamal this week, for example? I don't know whether it was raised this week, but I do know it's been raised with the Egyptian government before at senior levels. Okay. Um, I, I do think this is a, a, a huge test. I, I probably don't need to convince you. Um, but the test is always how we treat our allies. It's easy to beat up Iran. We should beat up Iran over this and other issues. Um, but I think the, the, the test of the administration's uh, extraordinarily strong stated commitment to uh, defending human rights around the world and LGBTQI rights in particular, I think will be found in cases like Egypt where we have competing equities that have to be weighed. And so I, I sincerely hope that we, we see a, a decision on the aid that reflects those concerns. And I yield back. Gentlemen yields. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize uh, Representative Sarah Jacobs of California, who is the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global Corporate Social Impact for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I echo, echo my colleagues thanks for you holding this committee hearing on this very important topic. And Mr. Busby, thank you for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate the administration's commitment and prioritization of LGBTQ plus issues uh, as the sister of a trans brother and a gender nonconforming sibling and the proud representative of Hillcrest, the heart of San Diego's LGBTQ plus community. So these issues are, are deeply personal to me and, and I look forward to seeing the administration's actions on, on everything that was outlined in the memorandum. 
One of the promises that uh, I have not heard an update yet is on President Biden's commitment to ensure that every trans and non-binary person has the option to change their gender marker to M, F, or X on government identifications, including passports, which you well know the State Department uh, gets to control. Uh, and you know, currently, uh, I've heard from many constituents that if they wish to affirm their own gender on a passport, they need a medical authorization and are unable to do so if they've not physically transitioned from one gender to another. And as we know, there's not currently a, a third gender option. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was wondering if you could provide a status update uh, from the Biden administration and the State Department on how you'll be advancing these priorities. Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. I once lived in San Diego for a year, and Hillcrest is one of my favorite neighborhoods is, uh, among those many in San Diego. Um, all I can say about uh, the passport issue is that it's being actively looked at. Can't say more than that, but it is actively under consideration. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. If you need anything from us, please let us know. And um, you well know how important it is. As President Biden likes to say, it's the power of our example as much as the example of our power. Um, I wanted to follow on a couple of my colleagues' questions um, when they were asking how we've been able to engage on these issues with our allies. Um, I, I do hope the presidential memoranda is fully implemented. And that being said, uh, I also know that sometimes these memorandums can be great in theory, but not always translate to concrete actions and real influence in our foreign policy calculus, especially as my uh, colleague, uh, Representative Malinowski said, when there are competing equities. So I was wondering um, if you feel like you and your team have adequate support from leadership to really prioritize these issues and push back when needed, both within the department and within the interagency. Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I do feel like, we do feel like in DRL, that we have the support of leadership, uh, which is reflected in the ways in which both President Biden and Secretary Blinken have indicated that human rights and democracy will be at the center of uh, U.S. policy. Great. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, I do hope that we'll be able to include this important issue in, in all of our bilateral relationships. And um, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. I now recognize Representative Juan Vargas of California, who is the Vice Chair of the Committee on the Western Hemisphere, Civilian Security, Migration, and International Economic Policy for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to thank you. I knew that uh, when we all selected you as our chairman that you would take us in great directions, bold directions, and you have. And I really do appreciate it. I, too, think that this is historic, and I thank you deeply. The only word I would caution you, Mr. Busby, when you praise one part of San Diego, careful, because I represent the other part. Remember to praise it all. <laughs> um, I, I was going to first ask you about how we could work together um, to help Afro-Latinos, especially from the countries of Central America, gain access uh, to some visas, because the reality is the, the Black Caucus, a number of members and myself, we traveled to Tijuana and saw how they suffered and how difficult it is for them, the discrimination that they face in Mexico and Tijuana in particular. But I'm going to put that aside just for a second to state the obvious. And the, the obvious has been stated briefly, but I think it should be stated more openly, and that is, when I first got here, and, and this is maybe the benefit of going last, I heard the ranking member ask questions about the Uyghurs in China, and I assume that the majority of the Uyghurs are not part of the LGBTQI community. Um, he asked about Christians around the world, and I assume that most Christians around the world are not members of the LGBTQI community. He asked also about Jews around the world, and I imagine they're not, not the majority of them are not members of the LGBTQI community. In fact, when I look at the subject of this hearing, it says, advancing and protecting LGBTQI rights abroad. That's a subject. And it seems that a lot of our colleagues are afraid even to talk about the subject. And I find that to be very, very sad. One member did from the other side of the aisle, and I want to thank her for speaking squarely and honestly about this issue, because we all should. We should all speak with one voice. These are basic human rights that are guaranteed to every person in the United States and abroad, and we should be together 
on these issues. I mean, it, it, it's, it's something that I find perplexing. I also find perplexing because, you know, in my own family, too, I have a member, my family, who's gay. And I'll bet you many members in the family of my colleagues also have members of the LGBTQI community, and for some reason, they're not here asking important questions, and they should be, and I think that that should be pointed out. I hope soon that we will have unity in our country over this issue, because I think it's so important. With that being said, as I think it had to be said, I do want to talk to you about Priority One referrals for Afro-Latinos. Um, if you think about, and I'm, and I'm sure you understand already the the discrimination that they get for being part of the LGBTQI community. Also discrimination they face because of African descent in Mexico, which is Tijuana. What can we do to speed the process along? I know you said it's a little bit out of your bailiwick, but you're a very important person. Or maybe I'll ask Mr. Malinowski, who seems to have a higher rank. Um, what can we do? How can we help? Well, thank you for the question, Congressman. Alas, this is an issue that's outside my purview, but I'm happy to take it back and talk to my colleagues in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration and the Bureau of Consular Affairs uh, to see what we know about the issue and what we can do about it. Well, you, you said that earlier, and I'm not going to let you get away with saying it's a little bit out of your purview. What, I mean, th we're talking about the LGBTQI community here, and what, what can you do? What, what can, how can we work together? It is out of your purview technically, but it's something that I think that we can all work on together. What can we do? I think the main thing that we in my bureau can do is look at the issue and report on any discrimination, any abuses we perceive with that community because that reporting then serves as the basis for either the priority one referrals that I referred to earlier uh, or uh, consideration of asylum claims, that type of thing. So. Uh, we can we can and will look at the issue. Well, make thank sure you. We're reporting on it accurately. I, I think that that's important, and I think you'll find that there's been huge discrimination against this population um, in Mexico, an ally, and and they have not been treated well. Uh, and again, I, I thank you for being here very much, and I hope that one day we can all speak with one voice. And again, I thank you. But please work on this issue. Please get a report out. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Brad Schneider of Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as everyone else has said already, I want to thank you and the full committee for having this important hearing. It is a, indeed an a honor and a privilege to be a part of this historic uh, hearing. My hope is it's not our, our last hearing on this subject. Uh, and I, and I, um, I want to get your, your title right. Um, Mr. Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Busby, uh, thank you for your patience in, in dealing with, with us. Uh, Mr. Malinowski uh, actually preempted the question I wanted to ask you, which is uh, where are we having successes? Because it's important to talk about the su successes we do have in spite of uh, so many challenges, it's challenges as you have highlighted around the world. And maybe I'll take a, a variation on the theme and ask you if you would to expand on uh, the allies that we're working with as well as the multilateral uh, agencies and, and NGOs who um, can support us in, in advancing the rights of the LGTP, LGBTQI plus community and how we might bolster those alliances to have uh, continued successes in the future. Thank you for the question, Congressman. Well, one of the areas where we're working closely with our allies is the Global Equality Fund. Indeed, I think we have 22 some odd, 20 some odd uh, partners there, uh, many of them from Western Europe, but not all of them from Western Europe. And I do think one of the ways we can increase attention to this issue and seek to address it uh, is through our collaboration in the Global Equality Fund. The other area is the UN, uh, both at the Human Rights Council in Geneva uh, and in New York, uh, in particular, the work of the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity is uh, an, an area where I think we can collaborate uh, to support his work, uh, which involves both reporting as well as uh, recommendations. So I think uh, finding uh, ways to collaborate in multilateral bodies uh, as well as through foreign assistance are two ways in which we can strengthen our 
uh, alliances with other countries on these issues. Great, and staying along in this line, but also kind of thinking back uh, over history, if I look back at the history of the United States, um, we've made great progress, uh, fits and starts, but over the last number of years, um, I've made some great, great leaps. Uh, on, on the international stage, are there opportunities that we might uh, pursue to, to make similar uh, significant jumps? Uh, and are there organizations or even individuals that we, we might in particular to seek to work with to try to advance that? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. I'm thinking here, I do think uh, the UN is a, is a great forum in which to advance these issues. Uh, we have a new uh, core group in Geneva uh, with which we're collaborating on these issues, and we already have one uh, in New York. And I think finding ways to speak with a unified voice in those fora is important. I also think reaching out to countries that may be in transition on these issues is a very important thing to do. So not simply talking amongst ourselves uh, who are already persuaded of the importance of these issues, but also looking to talk to uh, other countries that may be thinking about making some changes, but are looking to us for advice and support in doing so. Great, and, and my last question, uh, continuing this theme, are there, are there steps that Congress can take uh, as others have mentioned, I wish we had a, a greater bipartisan participation in today's hearing, uh, but are there steps that we can take as a body uh, supporting what you do, but also sending a message to the rest of the world? Well, I do think hearings like this are crucially important in calling attention to the issue, so I thank the chair and I thank the committee for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I do think engaging yourselves with other governments uh, is really, really critical. It's uh, one thing for the State Department to be raising the issue, that's the sort of official conduit. Um, but when members of Congress in their travels or in their engagements with other countries, other governments, raise these issues, I think it reinforces uh, the fact that this is an issue that the American people care about uh, and that Congress may take action on it affecting that particular country. So I would urge you to, to, to raise these issues and to talk openly about them. Uh, uh, the challenges we face here in the United States, as when it, well as any experiences you all may have as individuals, as part of your families uh, with these issues. Thank you, and if my last seconds, I'll echo that and, and say not only do I believe Congress has a role, but we have a responsibility to speak out and seek to make a difference uh, and defend the rights of, of all people, but in particular around the world, those who are um, facing the depression within the LGBTQI community. So thank you, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Let me thank you, Mr. Busby. Um, your service and your testimony here today uh, was absolutely tremendous. I'm going to look forward to continuing to work with you for the progress in advancing and protecting the human rights of the LGBTQI plus individuals at the Department of State and around the world. And I thank the administration for uh, noting the importance of and making sure that we're recruiting and retaining diverse diplomatic core and working groups uh, like GILFA uh, to ensure that LGBTQI plus persons are represented in the State the Department of State. Uh, this is important. I agree with what Ms. Houlihan said, though, also, that uh, it's got to be a message here in the United States, too, that we tell uh, our allies and adversaries all over the world they need to stand up. I am the brother of a gay man. Uh, I know, you know, we're different. People are different, except for one thing. We're all human. Every one of us. And we all should have dignity and the rights as a human being. It's tremendously important. It's important for me, especially, because when I think of even our country, the Constitution initially thought of people who happened to be of African descent as two thirds of a human being. We should know better and make sure that we treat all human beings 
with dignity and respect. And when we get there, we'll be a better country and a better world. We've got a long way to go, but your work, sir, will help us get there. Thank you for your testimony. So we will now, votes have started. And to our next panelist, I'm going to have to apologize because we're going to have to delay your testimony a little bit longer. Uh, we have three votes uh, that we will uh, have to take. And I will, four votes, OK. Four votes, which is approximately 80, what is it, 80 minutes? Approximately 80 minutes uh, before we finish voting. Uh, but. And then I promise you we will return uh, because I definitely want to hear your testimony. Uh, I have questions that I want to make sure that I ask of you. I'll ask members, as many as possible, to please return because I know that we have something very valuable to listen to in your testimony. So we will now recess until we finish vote, the fourth vote on the floor.
El comité reanuda. Committee now resumes. We were ready to begin with the second panel. Uh, so we now turn to the second panel of witnesses for introduction. So please, everyone, turn on your cameras. Uh, our first uh, witness will be Ms. Julie Dolph, who currently serves as a senior advisor to the Council for Global Equality, a coalition of 30 organizations working together for an inclusive U.S. foreign policy, which she co-founded in 2008. Then we have Ms. Najuri uh, Gutaru, is the executive director of the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Ms. Najaru uh, is a human rights lawyer with experience working on the protection of minorities in Kenya. Uh, the NGLHRC is an organization that engages in strategic litigation in support of rights and protections of LGBTQI plus persons in Kenya. Our third witness is Ms. Isabel Gonzalez, who will have interpreters. Ms. Gonzalez is an activist and a human rights defender working with the Alejandre Collective, an LGBTQI plus organization based in El Salvador, and is a survivor of transphobic violence at the hands of the National Civil Police. The final witness is Mr. W. Cole Durham, Jr., the director of the International Center for Law and Religion, Religious Studies at Sousa Young Gates University, professor of law at the J. Reuben Clark Brigham Young University Law School. Foreign Affairs. The wit witnesses, you will have five minutes to deliver your opening remarks. You'll also have an interpreter for one of the witnesses, and I'll make allowances to account for the time used for interpretation. I will gently tap my gavel when you have 30 seconds left so that you may conclude without objection. Your prepared written statements will be made a part of the record. I now recognize Ms. Dorff for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, and members of the committee. It is an honor to be part of the first ever HVAC hearing on the human rights of LGBTQI people today. The power of the human rights field is in the universal buy-in of a value system that affirms that every human being is born with basic rights and freedoms. 73 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed, minorities, especially the most marginalized, are more robustly claiming their own rights and pointing out the specific ways that their rights are uniquely denied. These are not new or special rights. They are basic human rights as they apply in particular ways to particular communities, including the LGBTQI people who are among the most persecuted in the world. There are 70 countries with criminal statutes against LGBTQI people, but more importantly than what is written in law, anti-LGBTQI stigma, discrimination, and violence are extreme and omnipresent. <clears throat> Often, abuses against our communities are the proverbial canary in the coal mine, signaling a broader human rights or rule of law deterioration. If you look around the globe this Pride Month alone, you'll find countries like Uzbekistan, further criminalizing homosexuality and leaders of their legislature calling for the expulsion of LGBT people writ large. Or 15 of the 41 gay youth recently arrested in Uganda forced to undergo anal examinations while in jail, a practice that should be universally condemned as torture or rape. Or just two weeks ago, right after Vice President Harris's return from Guatemala, Local trans leader Andrea Gonzalez, director of Ote Trans, was murdered along with another trans woman and a gay man. Or last week, a young Chechen lesbian was kidnapped by her family as she tried to escape Kadyrov's oppressive regime, her whereabouts still completely unknown. What we can all agree is that this treatment runs counter to everything our country should stand for respect for individuals, for their privacy, their freedoms, and a societal spirit of inclusion. On top of the moral imperative to protect basic human rights of LGBT people around the world, we know from recent studies that greater legal protections against discrimination for LGBTQI people correlates to higher GDP and greater free rights for all. 
Human rights are indeed interrelated, indivisible, and not at odds with one another. Even our former ambassador for international religious freedom, Sam Brownback, near the end of his term said publicly that countries that treat LGBTQI people well tend to also afford greater religious freedom. If you think about it, everyone should wanna live in a society that protects and integrates its LGBTQI citizens because it makes everyone safer and healthier. It's good for democracy and it's also good for the bottom line. Acting PDAS Busby discussed earlier the mem president's memorandum on the human rights of LGBT LGBTQI people, which has been a fantastic start for this administration, but there is so much more that we could all be doing. First, we need to bring our domestic and our foreign policy more into alignment. What happens here generally and for LGBTQI Americans, both the good and the bad, disproportionately impacts people around the world, as well as our reputation and our credibility. Whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, the treatment of transgender Americans, what happens to intersex children in American hospitals, the death of a trans woman in ICE detention, or whether big tech is held accountable for online harassment, it is noticed and felt around the world. We have a moral imperative to further perfect our own democracy, including the treatment of LGBTQI Americans in order to effectively lead on these issues abroad. Secondly, we need to work even more multilaterally. While we have scores of partners in the Global North and Global South that share our values and support LGBTQI rights, most of them have fewer embassies around the world and fewer diplomats. So even the LGBT friendliest of nations welcomes US engagement and indeed leadership on these issues. Use our leadership to leverage even greater global engagement among our allies, not just at the UN and the OAS, but from our embassies, instigating joint demarches, sharing intelligence about quiet diplomacy efforts, bringing together diplomats with local civil society and authorities and even religious leaders in a safe space. Third, please increase the funding. Despite the very demonstrated need and excellent funding mechanisms at both state and USAID, funding levels are woefully insufficient. And the true integration of LGBTQ populations across our development programs is at its infancy at best. It's time to properly fund this work at a minimum level of 60 million a year. The upcoming Summit on Democracy provides another opportunity for multilateral commitments to this agenda, including resourcing areas that have not been done before, such as anti-poverty programming, specifically for LGBTQI people. And lastly, as it has been noted earlier today, make human rights, including LGBTQ rights, a bipartisan issue. There is no reason that basic human rights and individual freedom should be split on a partisan basis. It's time to pass the GLOBE Act, the International Human Rights Defense Act, the Global HER Act, and the Global Respect Act on a bipartisan basis. Our country stands firmly on the right side of these human rights issues, but we could be doing so much more with a little more political will and a little more financial to live our democratic and human rights values. Thank you very much. Thank you for your statement. I now recognize Ms. Kataru. Uh, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Mix, uh, Ranking men Member McCall, esteemed members of the House of Foreign Affairs Committee, as we mark pride, as we mark pride Man this year, I thank you for holding this important hearing, for inviting me here today to discuss the state of LGBTQ rights in Kenya. My name is Njeri Gateru, a feminist human rights lawyer working for the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission in Nairobi, Kenya. NIGOLAC is an organization with a mission to promote and protect the equality and inclusion of LGBTQ persons and communities and advance their meaningful participation in, in society. Over the last eight years, NIGOLAC has won legal cases to allow for NGOs to be registered with, with the words gay and lesbian in their names and challenge the use of false anal examinations, often perpetrated to obtain evidence of a person's sexuality. Since 2016, Nigel Hack and other partners have led efforts to strike down laws that criminalize LGBTQ identities. Despite the 2010 Kenyan constitution containing a strong bill of rights, 
that has advanced judicial precedence on equality on and inclusion and remains one of the 69 countries in the world that criminalizes homosexuality with up to 14 years imprisonment. Nugolak is helping to lead efforts in the judiciary to challenge these laws. Though a petition was dismissed in May 2019, a decision that upheld this criminal statute, Nigolak and our partners have appealed this decision. Criminalization is widely used to, just, to justify a wide range of rights violations of Kenyans who are uh, perceived to be sexual and gender minorities and reduces instance of reporting, reporting of rights violations. Unfortunately, Kenyan society continues to espouse homophobic thinking and sentiment. In 2013, a world survey of attitudes around homosexuality found that Kenyans, Kenya was one of the most intolerant countries around homosexuality. Other studies have found that majority of Kenyans held anti-LGBTQ beliefs and believed that counseling or prayer could change a person's sexuality. The political front has also been, been illustrative of homophobic sentiment in the country. In 2015, our president, Uhuru Kenyatta, stated that gay rights were of no importance to Kenya. A year earlier, members of a fringe political sorry, there's a bit of interruption. A year earlier, members of a fringe political party had proposed an anti-homosexuality an anti bill in parliament, which increased punishments to life imprisonment or public stoning by death. As a result, the lived realities for sexual and gender minorities throughout Kenya continue to feature narratives such as corrective rape, uh, blackmail and extortion, violent attacks, especially of vulnerable LGBTQ persons, forced evictions, arbitrary arrests, and workplace discrimination. A 2019 study on violence, mental health, and access to healthcare shows that LGBTQ persons' lifetimes uh, prevalence of sexual violence is more than triple that of that among women in the general population. In Kenya, LGBTQ people's access to healthcare was also undermined by the global gag rule. The dangerous policy forced trusted and welcoming uh, LGBTQ health providers to choose between receiving US global health assistance and providing compre comprehensive healthcare. The global gag group, such as clinics who um, previously provided queer people and uh, queer people um, services and disrupted other services, including HIV treatment and prevention, putting their lives at risk. And for queer refugees, the vulnerabilities are, are exacerbated. Kenya currently hosts about uh, 1,100 LGBTQ refugees throughout the duration, who throughout the duration of Displa displacement experienced multiple instances of discrimination and violence. Kuma refugee camp reports the highest um, reports of violence, including arson attacks, which have resulted in the death of a queer refugee earlier this year. And for urban queer refugees, we have received reports of denial of service, forcing refugees to seek private and expensive alternatives. The effects of COVID-19 pandemic have also been felt deeply by our community. We have seen a marked increase in reports of harassment, arrest, and detention by community members. We've seen specific targeting of LGBTQ refugee safe houses, attacks from families and neighbors, discrimination and stigma in isolation centers, and increased risk reporting of intimate partner violence. The lockdown guidelines have forced shut safe spaces and safe spaces in the LGBTQ friendly organizations, including those who provide mental health and HIV treatment and prevention services. A significant number of the LGBTQ work workforce uh, held informal jobs which suffered greatly with the upheaval of the pandemic. We continue to receive numerous report of, reports of evictions, loss of livelihoods, and a lack of humanitarian support available for constituents. LGBTQ advocacy and legal work was greatly affected by the closure of public institutions, including the judiciary, Re resulting in major delays in, the, in our litigation processes. We also in, experienced a sharp decrease in funding opportunities and other resources for LGBTQ work. As the US considers what role it should play in, prom in promoting LGBTQ rights, I would encourage you to one, ensure support in multi multilaterals and embassies, two, invest in LGBTQ rights programs, three, uphold non-discrimination in US foreign assistance and tracking 
organizations that are undermining sexual and reproductive health and rights abroad. Uh, four, increase resettlement for LGBTQ refugees. And five, permanently replace the global gag rule. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. I submit the rest of my written testimony for the record. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, and thank you for your patience. I want all the members to know that uh, in Kenya, it's just past midnight or approaching midnight. I think just approaching midnight, and your patience has been uh, uh, much appreciated and your statement much valued. I now recognize uh, Ms. Gonzalez. You're now recognized for five minutes. Presidente Mayor, miembro rango y estimados del Comité de Relaciones Exteriores de la Cámara. Gracias por tener esta audiencia e invitarme a dar mi testimonio hoy. Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, and esteemed members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify here today. Mi nombre es Isabela González y soy una mujer transgénero salvadoreña. My name is Isabella González and I am a transgender woman from El Salvador. Mi testimonio trata sobre el arresto injustificado por parte de los agentes de la Policía Nacional Civil. My testimony is about my unjustified arrest carried out by the National Civil Police Force en conjunto la Fiscalía General de la República de El Salvador. together with the Attorney General of the Republic of El Salvador. Un 17 de junio del 2017, donde se violentaron mis derechos y irrumpieron mi casa asegurando tener una orden de captura acusándome de delitos y de agrupaciones ilícitas. This took place on June 17th, 2017, when my rights were violated. The police broke into my house at dawn, claiming to have an arrest warrant, which I never saw, and accused me of being involved with criminal groups. Recibí intimidación, golpes, me forzaron a firmar documentos en blanco, castigos injustificados durante mi detención. The police verbally intimidated me and physically attacked me, forcing me to sign documents that were blank. And during my subsequent detention, I was tortured. Acompañado con actos de tortura, por ejemplo, me obligaron a quitarme las uñas postizas o eh, con navaja y quedando mis dedos sangrando. The police, for example, forced me to use a knife to remove my fake nails leaving my fingers cut and bleeding. Me dieron pasada, patadas en costillas, piernas, glúteos, y el uso del baño era solo una vez al día y no me permitieron ningún tipo de alimentación. I was kicked in the ribs, legs, and buttocks. I was only allowed to use the bathroom once a day, and I was not given any food. The police took my personal belongings. También hicieron el uso o el robo de mis experiencias personales con mi billetera y dinero y bueno recibí burlas, señalamientos, hostigamientos, humillaciones ofreciéndome sexualmente a los otros reclusos. I was only allowed to use the bathroom once a day and was not given any food. My personal belongings were taken, my phone, my wallet and the cash in it. During my detention, I suffered stigma and discrimination for my gender identity. I was bullied, harassed, and humiliated. The police offered me sexually to other inmates, forcing me to undress in front of the police force. Obligándome a desnudarme en frente de todos los policías y el miembro de la Fuerza Armada del Salvador. I was forced to undress in front of the police and in front of the armed forces of El Salvador. Durante mi captura, el policía responsable de la delegación trató muchas veces de persuadirme de mi identidad de género. Estaba aludiendo que estaba siendo engañada por el diablo. During my detention, the police officer in charge tried many times to persuade me to renounce my gender identity and alluded that I was being deceived by the devil. Utilizando la Biblia, ignorando que somos un país laico y no puede ejercer sus creencias religiosas en el lugar donde funge 
tu oficio o su, su labor como funcionario público. He alluded that I was being deceived by the devil, citing the Bible, which ignores the fact that we are a secular government and that government officials should not employ their religious beliefs in this capacity. Los fundamentos religiosos son utilizados por personas conservadoras para negar los derechos de la población LGBT, incluso desde sus cargos públicos. Religious arguments are often used by conservatives to deny the rights of LGBTI people, including those that are in public service. Después de seis días salí libre por caución, bajo medidas suscitativas y eh, con detención provisional, pero siempre seguí en proceso de investigación. After six days, I was released on bail, but kept under alternative measures for provisional arrest, and I remained under investigation. Se denunció a la Procuraduría de la Defensa de los Derechos Humanos, la cual no dio respuesta a mi denuncia, resumiendo que la delegación donde sufrí mi proceso de detención este, lanzó un, un documento donde decía de que no se me trató mal y siempre mi trato fue digno durante mi, mi my, arre my arrest was reported to the office of the human rights ombudsman who did not respond to my the complaint that I filed beyond indicating that the police station where I was detained did not mistreat me nor stigmatize me or discriminate against me without a thorough investigation the ombudsman opted to believe the police report and ignore the evidence that I provided with my testimony Decidieron darse con la, eh, el informe de la Policía Nacional Civil y no con las pruebas que yo les había mostrado junto a mi testimonio. They kept the police report and put aside all the evidence that I had provided. A lo largo de dos meses de este mismo 2017, sufrí acoso, hostigamiento y persecución por parte de los agentes de la Policía Nacional Civil. Later in 2017, after learning that I had filed this complaint against the police, I continued to be harassed and persecuted for two entire months. Al enterarse que existe una denuncia en su contra, eh, bueno, este decidieron atacarme hasta intentar asesinarme, disparándome desde la patrulla cuando yo regresaba de mi trabajo a altas horas de la noche. As I mentioned, they harassed and persecuted me, and this extended to an attempted assassination. They shot at me from a police car late one night when I was returning home from work. A causa de esos hechos, decidí realizar desplazamiento forzado internamente, abandonando mi casa, familia y amigos. Y donde busqué ayuda en un eje como con Cadistran, quienes me brindaron el apoyo y la asesoría necesaria. So as a result of these events, I was forced to abandon my home, my family, friends, and dreams. I sought help from NGOs like Concabes Trans, who provided me with the support and advice I needed. In este país, hay víctimas fatales a causa del estigma y la discriminación que sufren las personas en LGBTIQ+. In El Salvador, LGBTIQ people are still being murdered because of stigma and discrimination. El Salvador tiene una deuda histórica con la población transgénero para rechazar una y otra vez la identidad de género. El Salvador has a historical debt to the transgender population, having rejected over and over again the proposed gender identity law. Un vivo ejemplo es lo que recientemente pasó con la nueva asamblea legislativa que mandó a archivo la nueva propuesta de ley. This is apparent as the new Legislative Assembly took office and took this a step further by archiving the proposed gender identity law, ignoring the effort of civil society organizers. Propuesta de ley que con mucho esfuerzo de, de, de sociedad civil ha trabajado a través de la formación de una mesa de la identidad de género. CSOs worked tirelessly to develop and advocate for this passage of this law through the permanent working group for gender identity law in El Salvador. Así como mi caso, hay muchos casos más. Ejemplo, el caso de Camila Díaz, quien murió a manos de agentes de la Policía Nacional Civil. For example, there are many other cases like mine. 
Camila Diaz is a transgender woman who was murdered by the National Civil Police after being deported from the U.S., where she was denied political asylum in 2019. Camila Diaz este, sufrió este acontecimiento días de haber sido deportada de los Estados Unidos y negó asilo político en el 2019. She had requested political asylum, was refused and deported. También está el caso de Francis Lamentes, activista trans, que fue asesinada en sangre fría en el 2015 y que su caso hasta el día de hoy está impune. Another case is Francela Mendes, a transgender activist who was murdered in cold blood in 2015 and her case remains in impunity. No olvidemos la masacre en el 2017 en el departamento de La Paz, donde cuatro mujeres transgénero fueron asesinadas a barbarie en manos de la familia de la zona. We must remember the 2017 massacre in the municipality of La Paz, where four transgender women were brutally murdered by local gangs. También está el caso de Jade Díaz, que fue encontrada muerta, atada de pies y manos a una roca en un río de la zona oriental del país en el 2019. Another case is Jade Diaz in the eastern part of El Salvador, who was found dead in 2019 in a river with her hands and feet tied to rocks. Yes, sí, hay muchas violaciones, torturas y muertes. And there's so many more stories of rape, torture, and death. And if I started to enumerate them, I'd never finish. Tuvemos un estado patriarcal machista que nos brinda el más mínimo interés en investigar estos casos de crímenes por odio quedando impune todos estos casos. Let's also mention the patriarchal and sexist state that does not provide the slightest interest in investigating these cases of hate crimes and they remain in impunity. La población LGBTI en El Salvador sufre día tras día desplazamiento forzado interna como externamente. The LGBTIQ population in El Salvador suffers day after day including forced internal and external displacement because of the violence perpetuated, perpetrated by gangs in the state. Todo esto a causa de la violencia por parte de pandillas y hasta del mismo Estado quien no brinda leyes que protejan y hagan valer nuestros derechos como seres humanos. Gang or official violence do not provide the laws and protect and enforce our human rights. There's total disinterest in this alarming situation that we're facing as a vulnerable population. Mostrando desinterés totalmente ante la situación alarmante que estamos viviendo como población vulnerable. There's total disinterest in this situation and we as a vulnerable population face it on a daily basis. Para este gobierno la población LGBTIQ en El Salvador no existimos. As far as this government is concerned, the LGBTIQ population does not exist. El gobierno debería aprobar una ley de identidad de género para que podamos tener documentos que reflejen nuestra identidad y no sufrir más discriminación. The government should pass a gender identity law so that we can have documents that reflect our identity and avoid discrimination. También debería impulsar las investigaciones para que las personas que violentan nuestros derechos sean rindan cuentas incluso si son personas del mismo estado y que nuestros casos no queden impunes. The government should also push for investigations to hold accountable those who violate trans people's rights, including public servants. Everyone should be accountable. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that brave and uh, powerful muchas gracias, muchas gracias. statement. Uh, we really uh, thank you for that. I now go to the final panelist. I recognize Mr. Durham for his statement. You're now recognized for five minutes. Meeks, uh, Mr. Chairman Meeks, Mr. Ranking Member uh, McCall, and honorable members of the committee. It's an honor for me to appear today as a panel on this, at this historic meeting. At the outset, I want to emphasize that I'm appearing in my personal capacity and my testimony will summarize the more extensive uh, testimony that I've submitted earlier. We have heard extensive testimony today about the significant problems faced by LGBTQI plus people worldwide. In my comments, I want to focus on how these problems can be addressed in ways that reduce polarization and improve the likelihood of acceptance and implementation uh, reforms. 
Uh, I agree with those who have said today that this is really a bipartisan issue, a broadly human issue. In my remarks, I'll be stressing uh, the significance of paying attention to religious rights, but I do so not to disparage LB LGBTQI plus rights, but because I think that better protection will be achieved by protecting all rights. And I uh, uh, second those who have stressed the importance of doing so. The key from my perspective is to remember that the, the starting words from our Declaration of Independence that all men and women, I need to add, are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. This ideal is now embedded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the panoply of rights protected under international law and the constitutional law of most nations. The task is to protect these rights and underline human dignity they respect, not just but for some, but for everyone, everywhere. We need to reduce invidious discrimination, but we need to be discriminating about discrimination. Not all forms of discrimination are invidious. Genuine liberty presupposes pluralism, a society with differentiated religious and philosophical worlds, worldviews, and differing lifestyles and life stances. What centuries of experience with principles of freedom of religion or belief have taught us is that social peace is best advanced and solidified by finding ways to optimize the respect for the equal freedom and dignity of all, thereby assuring that people can live together in peace and prosperity despite deep differences. It's important to remember that there are many areas where the rights of LGBTQI plus persons align with the rights of religious believers and communities, though there are, of course, areas where their respective interests, beliefs, and lifestyles collide. What is vital is to see seeing these tensions as a tragic zero-sum game that, and finding ways to optimize protections for all concerned. In this regard, my testimony addresses the principle of finding practical concordance, the idea that we need to find holistic interpretation of the panoply of human rights, which does not result in one group's, dom right, one group's rights dominating and repressing the others, but which optimizes protections for the rights of all to the greatest extent possible. Utah's recent experience in passing compromise legislation protective of both LGBTQI plus rights and religious freedom rights showed not only that such compromises can be worked out in significant areas of social life, an important and often unnoted result is that tensions have been reduced and Utah is now tied for second place among states in the nation in popular support, 77%, for LGBTQI plus rights. My testimony highlights a case argued last month before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights involving a woman who lost her certification to teach Catholic religion in a public school when she came out as a lesbian. Significantly, she did not lose her employment nor her right to teach religion or ethics in general. She, she just lost the right to teach Catholic instruction. So, uh, she transferred to a position uh, with increased pay and continued at her school until retirement. Yet the Inter-American Commission held that she had been impermissibly discriminated against on the basis of sexual orientation. A better approach, respecting the rights of all concerned, was Chile's approach, which protected her employment, but also the rights of children, parents, believers, and the church to select teachers of Catholic religion who exemplified their beliefs. Too often, well-intended efforts to prevent discrimination are overbroad and unnecessarily threaten freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression. My testimony explores such overbreadth problems with respect to the Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination and Intolerance that has been adopted by the Organization of American States. Fortunately, this has been ratified by only two countries over the past eight years. It potentially calls for criminalization of mere expression of traditional religious beliefs, whether by believers or by uh, uh, the press. Canada initially supported the convention, but withdrew its support because of its overbreadth. The most effective reforms still will still seek to find practical concordance that optimizes the rights for all. This committee should encourage that kind of approach in all aspects of U.S. foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good, uh, Mr. Durham.
Uh, I'll now, I will now recognize members for five minutes each pursuant to House rules and all time yielded for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. I'll start by recognizing myself. Uh, and let me uh, uh, first say to Ms. Gonzalez, I, I just want to thank you again for your uh, powerful testimony uh, and, and sharing your story with us today. Um, you know, I, it, it hits one in the heart uh, to hear about the abuses uh, uh, and the denial, basically, of human rights uh, that you have uh, suffered uh, and, uh, by, at the hands of the Salvadorian police uh, and, and that state. And it seems clearly to me that the government, uh, you know, said they was, had pledged to support the advancement and protection of human rights of LGBTQI plus individuals, but clearly they have not. So the, the question is uh, that I have for you, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, um, what do you think is the, is the, is the biggest challenge uh, facing LGBTQI plus activists in El Salvador, and what's the most effective steps that you think that we can take as members of the United States Congress uh, to, uh, to help combat the violence and discrimination against Char LGBTQI? Contra esta violencia. Clearly, the fight for human rights. El mayor obstáculo que se da posiblemente faces the greatest obstacle and freedom of expression. We're not allowed to speak our minds. You sent a question to una forma directa esta para que nuestros derechos sean se hagan valer. Perhaps the best way to help would be to exert pressure uh, or somehow force our rights to be uh, respected and that we would be able to express ourselves. Claramente no contamos con una ley o una ley o leyes que nos protejan como población vulnerable. Entonces, esos son los obstáculos más grandes que nos, que nos topamos con el día a día como población transgénero en el país. So clearly we lacked we lack laws that protect us and uh, protect our rights being violated. And I think that's the uh, greatest need that we have as a transgender population in El Salvador. Thank you. Let me go to Ms. Dolph uh, real quick. Uh, Ms. Dolph, in your testimony, you stated that uh, countries that treat LGBTQI plus people well also um, afford greater religious freedom. Can you explain or give more context to that statement? Well, I was actually quoting um, our ambassador for international religious freedom, Sam Brownback, at the end of the um, Trump administration. Um, and that was, you know, uh, I, I think just an example of how interrelated freedoms are. Um, rather than seeing them as oppositional, I think that they more likely uh, go hand in hand. It's been mentioned a number of times today, uh, the difference between um, more democratic countries versus more autocratic countries. And what is very clear through actual research is that, uh, is, is that places that treat LGBTQ people better and have more protective laws typically also are more democratic and afford other freedoms, including religious freedom. Um, I do want to just mention that, you know, I think that it's it's a little bit of a false, um, you know, tension. Uh, it's very rare that, that my freedom infringes on somebody else's religious rights. And in fact, the, the one, um, a specific case that was just mentioned in Chile, I mean, there's there's no reason that because that woman is a lesbian that she's any worse of a Catholic teacher. Um, she might be the best one in the school um, and she might be a devout Catholic. I mean, there are the, it is much more common that in places where religious freedom is being denied to LGBT people, that we see a restriction on freedoms writ large. So that was my point. Thank you very much for that answer. Let me quickly go to Miss uh, uh, 
Ms. Gaturu, Ms. Gatarvu. Um, my question to you is, um, what challenges do you face in regards to the strategic litigation that your organization uh, is dealing with now and, and groups like it? And, and how can the United States uh, and dip diplomatic missions uh, be helpful to you in that mission? Um, thank you for the question. I think, I mean, generally the, the challenge is, is criminalization. This is what we go to court to litigate against. Um, and I think what criminalization that then creates is a system where there's institutionalized homophobia, where you see um, um, institutions, um, the judiciary, the police service, um, other services that are supposed to be useful and protective of um, Kenyan citizens, um, kind of um, embrace ideals that aren't, are anti-LGBTIQ, anti-equality. And so we struggle through that um, in the work that we're doing in courts to kind of um, remove the laws and to, report, to repeal the laws. Um, in 2019, when we, I think, um, uh, had our biggest setback, where the High Court said that the evidence that we provided to them was not enough um, to justify a repealing of the, of the law, um, the, the, the question that then started with our communities is, um, was what is sufficient evidence that we are violated consistently and what is sufficient evidence that we are, you know, like we're hurt and we're in pain and that we're routinely discrim discriminated against in our access to health services, in our access to information, in our access to, you know, basic human rights. So I think where we exist um, within a criminalized state, um, what we see is that uh, is that we find continuous justification for the pain and for the discrimination and the, the stigma, stigmatization of LGBTQ people. And then we see that then fold out in different layers, whether it means that people are, you know, unfairly uh, terminated from their jobs or evicted from their places of re residence, or if, if it means violence or corrective rape or other kinds of violations. And, 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 and so that kind of um, wraps up into some kind of ball with multiple layers, depending on what the reality of the person who's, who's affected is. Thank you very much. And you. My time has expired. Uh, I'm now going to recognize uh, Representative Bill Keaton for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their patience, but also the testimony is clearly worth waiting for. Uh, I want to uh, recognize uh, Ms. Gonzalez for uh, courage and what she's gone through and all the uh, people who witnessed for their commitment. Um, you know, my testimony and my questioning of Mr. Busby in the first panel, uh, I dealt with uh, the issue that even where there are laws, they mean nothing unless there's enforcement. And I think your testimony brought some of those things uh, really to the forefront. But I'd like to give you as much time as you'd like to take, uh, any of you, uh, to, to discuss something else. We discussed the horrific, violent, uh, sometimes fatal actions uh, that were inflicted on uh, innocent individuals. But if you could, the discrimination permeates much more than even these awful acts. It, it's the discrimination that people live with every day. So if you could, uh, Take a few minutes, uh, I would hope, and share some stories that, that you know of or experienced in daily life, how hard it is. The, the ability to, to have basic needs covered. The, what happens, the difficulty in trying to get a place to live, uh, to try and get decent health care, to try and go to school and be educated, to try and get or keep a job. These are the things that happen every day, day in and day out. And I think it would bring home just how serious an issue this is, even beyond these awful violent incidents, but what happens every day. So I'd like to share the, my time, if you could, uh, one of you or any of you want to share that kind of story.
Isabella would like to respond. Does she have the floor? She's recognized, yes. Como mujer transgénera enfermera, graduada de la una en universidad. Transgender woman. Puedo dar and a nurse, testimonio. and I graduated from school, and I can bear witness to the fact that dignified employment in my country as a transgender woman is uphill. Accessing other services such as health, education, perhaps a transgender woman sees this as a privilege. Our system forces us to deny our gender identity if we want to go to school or work or access health services. In addition, our ID document is not consistent with our gender expression, our appearance. When I go places, I seek a job. I'm a female in, in appearance, but I have a male name on my ID card. So we have many things blocked out to us. We have no access. At least this is the case in El Salvador. Does anyone else want to comment on some of the? Yes, uh, uh, Ms. Dorr. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I think that the COVID uh, last year and a half has really exemplified how the LGBT community is in particular, um, is particularly vulnerable on a number of levels. But, but one of the things that was really eye-opening even to a 30-year veteran in this space was how the vast majority of LGBTQ people across all regions of the world are in are employed, if at all, in the informal labor sector. And how when there was the kind of understandable shutdown during COVID, how people were disproportionately unable to feed and house themselves. Um, and so I think you're pointing to a really, really important area. Uh, that the US government is really only at its infancy on, which is genuine inclusion of the specific needs of these populations in our development programming, and particularly our anti-poverty work. Um, and we have, we have so much we could be doing in that space and a fantastic opportunity with the Summit of Democracies coming up um, uh, to, to start to address the, the genuine development needs with our funding. You know, related to our development funding, I think is also it's super important to look at our non-discrimination policies and to make them very, very overt around the world that with U.S. government funding, there will not be discrimination in service delivery or ideally and also in the employment from our implementers around the world on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. I think that would go a very long way towards addressing some of that daily stigma that you so rightly observe. Our time has expired. Um, okay. I'll yield back and I thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now uh, recognize Representative uh, Houlihan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. And I, um, I want to thank all of the panelists for coming and the witnesses for coming today and the chairman for putting together this historic panel. Uh, I want to echo something that people mentioned in the first uh, part of the panel, which is a real um, sadness that so few members of the, of the other side of the aisle attended this uh, really important conversation. And I want to say to Ms. Dorf, I really appreciate your very explicit directive in your opening statement and that the United States really has a moral imperative to further protect our own democracy, including the treatment that we have here of LGBTQI Americans in order to effectively lead on the issues abroad. It echoes a really important commitment that was made by our by our President Biden in his February 4th memorandum on Put the mic a little bit closer. On advancing the rights of LGBTQI people around the world for the U.S. Uh, we are failing in that mission right now. And in my home state of Pennsylvania, our Republican state legislature voted not once, 
but twice recently to curb civil rights for our LGBTQI Pennsylvanians. They voted to deny protection from discrimination for the LGBTQI plus community, cementing our regrettable status as the only state in the Northeast that lacks codified discrimination protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So Ms. Dorf, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed in the lack of conviction and courage on the part of my, my Commonwealth Republican uh, colleagues, as well as our colleagues here in, in this body, because the LGBTQI people of our community uh, really need to, to be uh, seen. And not just around the world, but just in my own in my own hometown. So Ms. Dorf, if you wouldn't mind explaining because I think it really is important for us to hear right now how the failure to protect the rights of LGBTQI people locally, at a state level, and nationally in the United States undermines our reputation and credibility globally. Well, thank you for uh, underscoring those points and for the for the question. I think um, you know I I am every day. Uh, both encouraged by the incredible activists around the world and their bravery and stamina and creativity, and also sometimes just utterly surprised at how important what happens in the United States is everywhere in the world. Uh, I can't tell you how many times as we were preparing for this election, I would be in touch with activists around the world and, and you know, they said, well, when we had Obama or you know, I, you know, they were just following every bit of our election because it does impact them uh, both in a uh, kind of psychic way and also in a real way in terms of what some particularly leaders in authoritarian regimes feel like they can get away with depending on how the United States is going to respond. Um, and in particular around the, uh, the treatment of transgender folks in the United States, I think that is noticed very deeply by people all over the world. Um, and, you know, and many cues are taken from us. So I, um, I don't have a great answer for how to, to deal with the, um, you know, the sort of extremism of the anti-trans moment in the United States or the, um, you know, the, the regressive forces that do exist here as well. Um, we just have to keep on uh, fighting for what we know is right. Um, but it absolutely does, does impact people everywhere what happens here. Um, similarly, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, was both, you know, was, was actually very, very inspiring to activists around the world, including LGBT activists around the world, who are primarily, when you get out of this country, are primarily people of color are, um, and very much relate to what happens uh, to, uh, to their bodies by society and by government forces. Um, and it was incredibly encouraging uh, to, to LGBT activists globally that there was that direct conversation about racism and that direct conversation about violence. Um, and was quite inspiring um, to folks. So I think um, you know it's a it's a bit of a double-edged sword for us to be transparent and honest about our problems here. Um, uh, but the the fighting back is also critical. Thank you. I really would respect your perspective, and I also appreciate Representative Phillips and Representative Wild for yielding me their time, and I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Susan Wow for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Dorf, um, I wanted to ask you, one of your recommendations is to make human rights, including LGBTQI plus rights, a bipartisan issue. This has been elusive, yes. Um, there are some members on the other side of the aisle who care. But it has been difficult to garner large numbers as evidenced by the absence of our friends across the aisle at this hearing. Um, give us some advice. How do we make people care about this? Well, uh, I, you know, there's obviously some many systemic uh, fixes that our country needs to address, like gerrymandering and things that make um, 
unfortunately, our country and our Congress more partisan than it should be or than is good for the American people. Um, I think Republicans know very deeply that uh, that there is growing support for LGBTQ rights in this country. Uh, only a few years after the U.S. Supreme Court has settled the question on the freedom to marry here, um, just last month, according to Gallup, you know, support for marriage equality is well over 70 percent across the United States, including 55 percent of voting Republicans. Um, so I think it's very um, clear that it, it it's no longer politically um, useful to be overtly anti-LGBT, um, but being supportive takes courage and takes, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we heard a number of members earlier today talk about people in their own families. I think sometimes those family members need to put more pressure on their Republican uh, families as well to uh, to hold them accountable because this is about real people's lives and I, that tends to be the 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 thing that uh, uh, helps motivate um, even the politically uncourageous to do the right thing. Well, so, everything uh, you say is absolutely correct. Unfortunately, um, waiting for people to have something. Uh, or find out that somebody in their own family would be affected by more uh, more and better rights um, isn't enough of a solution. And I appreciate the your concern and your inability to state anything more specific than that because it, quite frankly, is not something that there's a, a formula for. Um, I, I do want to ask a question of Ms. Gatero. Uh, Ms. Gatero, in your testimony, you write, we have seen a marked increase in reports of harassment, arrest, and detention by community members owing to increased policing and movement restrictions. We saw specific targeting of LGBTIQ plus safe houses where members were arrested and detained by officers who demanded bribes, and when they were unable to offer this, the members were charged with violating government protocols on COVID related to gathering. Um, I'd be interested in hearing you elaborate on this. Have you observed a systemic targeting of the LGBTQ movement under the pretext of pandemic restrictions? Absolutely, yes, we have. Um, I, I, I think what happens consistently with um, communities that are marginalized and then communities then get who are double or triple marginalized is that we see, um, I guess, a, a, a routine um, victimization of this uh, of these communities, and 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 so we saw that exacerbated within the um, within COVID and within the guidelines that came out, the government gu guidelines that came out of COVID. Um, what happened within um, that time that all of us were at home, and so everyone's neighbors were at home, and so there was more space for um, people to be more profiled and for neighbors to ask why in this house that has, you know, I guess, um, a shared, um, you know, shared spaces. Why is this um, space that's occupied by a male um, then, you know, often frequented by, by, by males? Or why is it that um, people who present in a certain way um, show up in a, you know with well, during the later evenings and, and 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 so you know sex workers would get profiled by that because of that and 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 such other situations so we did see um and and persistently that um police officers within you know a, a number of counties would go specifically to safe houses where we've seen refugees um, create a system of, um, I guess, siblinghood where they would, you know, they would, they would share housing and so share resources and then kind of like be accountable for each other's safeties, safety. And we've seen um, police officers go into those spaces particularly and have them arrested and, and charge them with, you know, where there was no space to charge them, you know, charge them with ridiculous things like, um, uh, contravening COVID guidelines, uh, which which wasn't fitting within that space. Um, we've seen 
um, other refugees, other LGBTQ refugees be charged uh, with things like um, existing out of um, camps where uh, Kenya recommends that um, refugees stay within camps and where they, where they don't and where they, they are urban refugees and there's specific regulations around that. So we've, we've seen that specific targeting. Um, we've seen um, where, you know, this kind of, you know, communities are brought to court, specific hurdles that are thrown um, um, and on the way. So where, whereas it would be very easy to get um, a Kenyan person charged, you know, with contravening COVID um, protocol out of, um, out, uh, out of jail, you know, on bond or bail, we saw that um, judges were very specific in, require, in requiring, you know, harder, um, you know, bail and bond um, uh, requirements. So they would say, for example, um, and a very recent example in, Ken in Nairobi, that a person would have to, uh, a Kenyan person with a salary of upwards of, uh, of 3,000 um, US dollars, which is, you know, like, which is significantly high for anyone in, in working in Kenya, uh, that such a person would have to stand surety for this person. So we've seen those specific things. And, and, and I think um, without an, a, an inner look, uh, one would not be able to identify that these are specific hurdles for our communities um, and that these are things that are not necessarily applied for anyone outside of the community. But then the ways that we've studied them and in the ways that they've presented to us in the last one and a half years, um, I think we're better able to recognize them now. Thank you very much. I'd Thank love you. to hear more, but my time has run out. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Dean Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and most importantly, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, as I said earlier, this committee was established in 1822. Uh, 200 years have passed, almost, and this is the first time that this committee is hold holding a hearing relative to the international rights of the LGBTQI plus community, and I want to salute you for that and point out to my colleagues uh, that there are 195 sovereign nations in the world, 195 nations, 76 of which, 76 countries still criminalize consensual same-sex relationships. We have a far way to go, and I want to thank our wonderful witnesses today for sharing your perspectives and, most importantly, your personal stories. Uh, it means the world to us, and we have your backs. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, Ms. Gutierrez, um, experts from the National Endowment for Democracy's Journal of Democracy have argued that U.S. LGBTQI plus rights advocacy overseas can run the risk of, quote, playing directly into the hands of local politicians eager to brand LGBTQI plus rights as, quote, foreign values and to rationalize their anti-LGBTQI plus policies as a defense against Western influences. Do you agree uh, with this perspective and if this is indeed a challenge? And if so, how can it be mitigated? Um, so I do agree with this sentiment, uh, but I think it's it would be 0.0% of what I would worry about in terms of um, a discussion about um, international support for LGBTQ persons um, and LGBTQ work um, abroad for, you know, uh, um, for, 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 from the US. I think um, all, all across the globe, there's um, what I would call lazy sentiment around um, opposition for equality and, and opposition for LGBTQ rights. And so we would have um, conversations about, you know, this is a Western thing or sometimes this is against, you know, religion, or this is against the family unit, and, and, and such, such and such, um, I guess, long-standing rhetoric that has been, I think, um, declassified and demolished for a long time, longer than we have been activists for. So I don't think that this would be a, a reason for concern for anyone, particularly any person who was working or who was intentionally engaging with um, efforts that were already on ground or efforts that were already in country. So if the support was support that was truly invested in growing whatever the work was in the country or whatever the work was in whatever specific place um, it was that we were having a conversation about, I don't think that the sentiment 
about this being a foreign issue would be a thing that would hold ground at all. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to ask you about uh, to what extent U.S. agencies are adapting their programs to fit local contexts uh, and conditions, and uh, to what extent are, are state and other U.S. agencies reaching out specifically to the LGBTQ I plus populations in various countries to help inform their programs and generate perspectives? Um, I think my friend and colleague Julie would have a better answer than, than me in this okay. in this uh, in this matter. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe Ms. Dorf, just because of, okay, if, if that's yes. the, and I appreciate it, if I just reclaim a little time, uh, Ms. Dorf, if you might answer okay. that question, I'm very curious okay. how our how state and our agencies are reaching out directly to communities to inform and illuminate their policies and programs. You know, overall, I think they do a pretty good job. Our and our our diplomats are usually there for the right reasons and and are good listeners and smart, effective uh, diplomats. But um, it is a little bit uneven out there in the field. Um, and certainly because in particular, I think because of the fairly quick rotation um, that occurs, which is great for a diplomat's career. But if you're an activist in a country, like all of a sudden your point of contact is gone and, and it, it might take another, you know, eight, 10 months before you've reestablished your relationship with the embassy. So I think all the embassies could do just a little bit better job. And I think our training around working with civil society could be a little bit more robust. Um, but overall, I think they do an excellent job and they often know things going on on the ground that we don't know back here in the U.S. So um, with just 10 seconds left, anything that Congress, uh, we here on this committee uh, or the Congress uh, more broadly can do to support those efforts? Pass the GLOBE Act. Okay. All right. I like quick answers. Thank you. I yield back. That's a great answer. Uh, <laughs> I now recognize uh, Representative David Cicilline for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, Ms. Jacobs uh, was going to ask go ahead of me because she has another commitment, and I'm happy to allow her to do that. She's still on. We, of course, will hear from the gentle lady from California, Ms. Jacobs, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cicilline, uh, for all of your work on this issue and for letting me go first. Um, I would uh, also like to thank Ms. Dorf and Ms. Gutero and Ms. Gonzalez for being with us and for sharing your stories and, and all of your work. Um, but I'd like to direct my question actually to Professor Durham. Um, in your testimony, you said that you will focus on how best LGBTQ plus rights can be advanced and protected. And, you know, I find it interesting uh, as someone who's not part of the LGBTQ plus community that you, uh, you feel strongly that you're best positioned to describe to this committee how the rights of the community should best be advanced and protected. And I actually think as an ally myself um, that those of us outside of the community have a lot to learn from LGBTQ plus folks such as those who spoke on the panel today. So Professor Durham, I wanted to ask you, what have you learned from the testimony today and have any of the statements from your fellow panelists brought in your view at all? Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, let, let me say that I think it's always important to engage in this kind of dialogue and to learn other things. If I were to, I, I mean, one of the things that uh, was pointed out is that, or people were, uh, uh, Congressman Wild was asking, what would help uh, get more support for these, for these issues? And, and I think one of the things I'm trying to say is, uh, on a huge number of these issues, the issues of, uh, uh, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, there's a tremendous amount of consensus. And and we need to be able to listen to each other and identify these areas of consensus. Uh, and I think what's, what's sometimes overlooked is the fact that religious communities are can be significant allies, but they're unlikely to be allies if they feel threatened by uh, things that require them to do things that are inconsistent with their beliefs and so forth. And that is why, for example, Shahid in his, the UN Special Rapporteur in his uh, comments last year talked about what I talked about, which is practical concordance. Uh, the, the point here is, is that we do need to listen to each other to find ways that we find the areas that are of consensus because they're huge. And, and, uh, 
to find ways to reduce the amount of polarization and fear. I, I agree with people here that this is this should be a bipartisan issue. We live in a country that's ex excessively polarized, and I think what we need to find are ways to depolarize, to reduce fear on all sides, and to find ways that we can really work together and live together. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, I find uh, listening to these kind of events, I, it broadens my understanding of the extent of the problems, uh, my sympathy for these problems, and, uh, and at the same time, I worry that there are uh, people on, on this side of the aisle who are not listening adequately to the fears that are being generated on the other side. We need to work to find ways better to work together. Uh, well, I will definitely agree we need to find better ways to um, work together, and I'm glad to hear that this conversation has broadened your understanding. Uh, as a religious minority myself, I take religious freedom very seriously, and I don't think that uh, making sure that our LGBTQ plus siblings have all of their rights uh, infringes in that in any way, but I will let my uh, colleague, Representative Vargas, talk okay. more about the religious implications. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. I now recognize Representative David Cicilline for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, again, want to say uh, thank you for your leadership and for convening this really historic hearing. And thank you to our witnesses for your very powerful uh, testimony. Ms. Gonzalez, uh, I think we're all horrified to, to hear what you endured. And sadly, we know that that uh, experience has happened to so many members of our community. And um, I, I hope this hearing not only raises the conscience of our own country, but people around the world to our collective responsibility to continue to be champions for human rights and the respect of every single individual and particularly the plight of the LGBTQI people around the world. So thank you for sharing your um, testimony today. Um, Ms. Dorf, we've had the opportunity to work together a lot in the concept of global equality and thank you for the great work that your organization does um, one of the things that I'm uh, very alarmed about, and I think you're seeing it all over the world, is this sort of, um, uh, re you know, democracies, you know, backsliding and the use of marginalized communities like the LGBTQI plus community as an explanation for all the things that are wrong in the society. And so what are ways that we should be thinking about civil society, working with civil society as, as a government? in places that are really hostile to LGBTQI rights. And, you know, what are, what's your advice about how we can be effective advocates for the LGBTQI community uh, while maintaining what are sometimes important strategic relationships and the kind of lessons you've learned in your work? Um, well, first of all, you know, thank you for your leadership um, on these issues for, for many years and for our partnership. Um, as well as other members on this committee. Um, and, you know, I think that the, um, uh, I, you know, th that's a tough question. Um, I think that, you know, there was a point that was made earlier um, in the first panel about the role of uh, U.S. anti-LGBT forces uh, working abroad. I think that's something we could do more of to curtail um, I think that would be helpful to, to our civil society uh, uh, partners around the world who are dealing in a very real way with uh, opposition forces, local opposition forces that are supported financially and with other kind of resources by um, what I would call extremists in this country. I think in general, the sort of uh, the backsliding on democracy and the anti-LGBT um, intersection with other forms of extremism, whether it's anti-Semitism, whether it's white nationalism, um, what's in increasingly um, labeled anti-gender ideology, like we were just seeing in Hungary, but we've also seen in Florida, you know, like that those, we can do more as a country to uh, disrupt those transnational phenomena. Um, uh, you know, I also think, I go back to my point about increasing the funding. I think, you know, those civil society groups need more support 
Um, and I appreciated um, PDES Busby's uh, uh, point about there being a little bit more than 10 million that the Global Equality Fund um, has uh, to give away in this current fiscal year. But, um, you know, we'd really like to see that at least tripled um, uh, to meet some of the needs. You know, and lastly, Isabella's incredibly powerful testimony and the question about what's going on in the Northern Triangle and those drivers of migration. I mean, those should be top priorities for investment and support is to communities in those countries. Thank you very much. And Ms. Gedaru, um, my last question is, you know, I think we look at the population in many African nations and the kind of youth, the young population. And I think, you know, we all look at that as an opportunity to kind of bring about some real change in attitudes about the LGBTQI community through, the, through young people. And I wonder if you have any advice about how we can best ensure that um, places like Kenya can, can present a real opportunity to work through young people to help make Kenya and places like Kenya a more welcoming, safe place for members of our community. I think my, my answer would be twofold. One, it would be to um, support the removal of structural barriers for um, young people in achieving the things that you know we're working towards. So, um, for example, criminalization, I'll keep going back to criminalization of um, um, homosexuality, not only affects us, but also ge the, the generations to come and justifies the continuous violence against LGBTQ people, therefore narrowing the possibilities of um, young people to have futures or to engage in specific spaces. Sorry, I'm, I'm pausing because I see... Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, 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 yes, I can. Oh, absolutely. Okay, thank you, thank you. I, I was worried about that. Um, but but basically what, I, what I'm saying is that um, criminaliz criminalization is not on, only a barrier to us who are activistic now, but also the future generations that are oncoming, right? And the second thing would be to um, harness the opportunities and to, uh, to harness the, I, I guess, the tools and, and the equipment that we have now to harness, you know, technology to make use of um, an enabling constitution that Kenya now has to, you know, reach for greater, um, you know, greater goals so that um, our realities, you know, are not the same as they were 10 or 15 years ago. And I think there are specific points at which um, support would be easily lashed on, um, lashed on um, the fact that we have such a wide and a progressive Bill of Rights, latch on to the fact that we are finally seeing an independent ju judiciary, latch on to the fact that we are finally working from a point where we have movements that are formalized, that are technical, that are engaging at a global space. There's so many opportunities, and I think it only needs um, to put your ear to the civil society or to the organizations that are working in these spaces at this point. And I, I, I think the, like it would be exponential, the things that we would be able to do then. Thank you so much. Thank you. My time is expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize uh, Representative Juan Valgas for five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate very much again you holding this hearing. I want to thank the witnesses and their patience. Um, I do want to answer one of the questions from my good friend, Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. Uh, back in 2013, Pope Francis said, and I'm going to quote, if someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? And who am I to judge? Uh, I very quickly looked up some of the articles while I was here, since she did bring it up and wanted me to answer part of the question. I th looked up the U.S. News and World Report dated July 29, 2013, written by Elizabeth Flock, an article entitled, Catholic Priests, It's Empirical Fact That Many Clergy Are Gay. And I thought about how a number of gay priests are magnificent priests and how well they've done their job as priests and how proud we are of so many of them that have served so well. And I also thought of the question, or not the question, but really the comment that was made by Ms. Dorff on the issue of 
a teacher who was teaching in a Catholic school and was a lesbian, could she be a good Catholic school teacher? And I thought of those priests. I know a number of priests who are gay, and I think they're absolutely fabulous priests. In fact, one in particular that I've known for a long time, I haven't seen him in years, but I like to go to confession. You know, I'm a devout Catholic. I, I like confession. Confession is very tough, though, because you go and tell people about your shortcomings, where you failed the Lord, where you weren't the person that God wanted you to be. And it's tough to confess that to somebody else. But when you have somebody on the other side who's understanding and someone on the other side who's gone through difficult times themselves, they're very compassionate and I think very judicious in what they tell you. In the, and, and again, uh, I, I thought about that as my good friend Sarah Jake has made that comment. So now that I've finished answering her question, I'm going to go to my question. And my question is this. Uh, we have a new administration. We have a new administration. And some of the comments that I heard here were, um, you know, we have Obama. This is great. Um, you know, things are changing. Well, we have a new administration. I know that my good friend uh, Dean Phillips started on this question, but I would ask, what, how, have, how have things changed at the State Department? How are we doing better now that we have a new administration, and I would start with uh, Mrs. Dorf. Ms. Dorf. Ms. Dorf, are you there? Yes, thank you, hi. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. You know, it's, it's a great start. Of course, you know, it takes a while to get all the right people in place, as we know. It takes a while for the Senate to confirm all those assistant secretaries and ambassadors and, and all of that. So there's still plenty to do. There's still a fair amount of commitments that the our new president made while on the campaign trail that haven't yet been, been fulfilled, but that we're hopeful will be, like non-binary passports and uh, a special envoy for LGBTQ rights. Uh, I believe we'll see some uh, openly lesbian and trans, uh, you know, officials in the foreign affairs side, which we haven't had before. Um, we have some promises around refugee rights that still need to be enacted. Uh, you know, there's quite a bit there. Um, you know, I think there's, uh, you know, the only thing that I heard earlier from the first panel um, that I would um, like to challenge is the, is the U.S. position on marriage equality. Um, now, of course, we shouldn't be pushing marriage equality onto countries that where that is not on the agenda, where activists are not fighting for it and where it's just not the right time. But um, but there are um, plenty of countries uh, where there is significant momentum in all regions of the world, the Czech Republic, Chile, Cambodia, Thailand, Panama, Peru, Vietnam, even China, where there's really viable marriage equality paths. And I don't think it's right any longer for the US to stay in this kind of neutral, we're neither for nor against. That's been quite settled here. Um, and in fact, uh, you typically, you know, look at Taiwan, you know, just, uh, you know, a couple years after marriage equality becomes the law, it's, it's uh, changed people's perceptions of us by, you know, 20 points. Like these are really powerful tools to change hearts and minds and to get to some of that um, uh, peace and acceptance among different people that, that um, you know, has been um, lauded here today. Um, you know, there's still plenty to do. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate my point about uh, in, increasing the budget to be a little bit more in line with the degree of totally documented persecution that comes out every single year in the annual human rights reports from the State Department. Um, I think that there's um, there's a, a point in the presidential memorandum about swift and meaningful re responses to abuses. There's plenty of that to do still, uh, but there's a few things we could do better and more of, more robustly. Um, I mean, decriminalization, getting rid of sodomy laws as um, Jerry's work in Kenya is so important. Um, but it's not, there's are not the only types of laws that are really bad for our populations. There's anti cross dressing laws, there's forced sterilization, there's medically unnecessary interventions on intersex babies, there's conversion therapy. All of those things need to be addressed. Um, my, my and simultaneously, has, I've gone over a little bit here, so I should, I should note that so to make sure that uh, 
the next people have some more time. I apologize, but my no, time has expired. But I really do appreciate, and I heard you earlier about rotation and better training. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I know my time has expired. Thank you. And I recognize Representative Joaquin Castro for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman, and thank you to our panelists on both panels now for your testimony uh, today. And Ms. Dorf, I want to ask you a question. You know, last year, Congressman Raskin and I worked with you and your organization to combat the Trump administration's efforts to undermine LGBTQI plus rights through the creation of the Commission on Unalienable Rights. With this commission, the Trump administration intended to weaken the longstanding bipartisan commitment to human rights principles in U.S. foreign policy and to inaccurately interpret U.S. obligations under the international human rights framework. And thankfully, the Biden administration has reversed this policy and upholds the fact that LGBTQI plus rights are human rights. And I wanted to ask you, why does it matter that the United States stands up for LGBTQI plus rights in our country and in our foreign policy? So both domestically here, of course, but also around the world? And how does that affect norms and human rights internationally? Well, thank you for the question. And also thank you so much for your leadership um, uh, as we've been working together for, uh, for the past few years. Um, it is so important that legislators such as yourself um, hold our government, whether it's Republican or Democratic, uh, hold our administration accountable for the things that they're supposed to be doing. And we really appreciate that. Um, you know, the, uh, I, I, the Commission on Unalienable Rights, thankfully, you know, is over. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, that, um, that draft report got uh, translated into many languages and was distributed fairly widely. And, and, you know, whether it's no longer U.S. policy or not, it's still out there. And I think there is still some unfortunate damage that was done um, through, um, you know, lifting up this concept of some rights being more important than others um, or that national interests are can um, actually usurp uh, or natural uh, national uh, histories can usurp the universality of human rights. I think those are really dangerous concepts um, to be out there, uh, it, you know, having been validated by the last administration. Um, but, you know, to the, to the question of how important is what the U.S. Uh, stands for, I, you know, it's critically important. I mean, it's, it's critically important that we participate in the appropriate multilateral human rights spaces and, and make sure that that is where international norms are set, not by us unilaterally. Um, and nonetheless, for better or for worse, this country has incredible power and prestige and disproportionate sway in the world. And so we have to use that well, responsibly and wisely and for the and, and for the betterment of real people's lives. Um, and so, you know, thank you for all of what you do to to make sure that our foreign policy is truly inclusive and displays our values. No, well, thank you for all of your work. And I asked the question earlier that uh, at least one of the questions, perhaps there was another one as well, that elicited the response on marriage equality and the U.S. position on advocating for it around the world. And I agree with you, especially because for several years now, this has been a decided issue domestically within the United States that I think we ought to be helpful uh, in terms of our foreign policy, our diplomatic work in countries where there is momentum, at least as you mentioned, for marriage equality to be helpful in pushing for that. Uh, I think that that's something that we should work through our State Department and our diplomats. Um, and so I'd be glad to follow up with you all on that as well. With that, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back his time. And look, I want to really thank all of our witnesses uh, for your time, your testimony, uh, for your, you know, passion. Sometimes when you are living history, you don't realize the significance and the importance of what you're doing on a regular basis. And I'm here to tell you, just listening to your testimony today, that the camera of history is recording what you're doing. 
because you're gonna make this place that we call Earth a better place. You're gonna make governments all over the world a better place because you're standing up for human rights. And that's what it's about. And we've gotta do it. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we don't stand up for human rights, for individuals who are LGBTQI plus today, then anybody who's human is in danger of not having the opportunity of self-respect, dignity, equal opportunity. And the loss of that will be to all of mankind because the contributions that individuals will make to us who are from the LGBTQI plus community is significant. Think of all the differences that we've had of folks throughout time. Had we not accepted other individuals who may not be exactly like us, there would have been a loss for humankind. You are creating and making history. And I really want to thank you for that. I want to thank the role that of organizations like the Council for Global Equity and the American Jewish World Service and Human Rights Watch and many others that support the work of, for folks for human rights on the ground. I want to thank you know, all of my colleagues. And I just wish we do need to have this to be a bipartisan uh, issue. I wish there was many more of my Republican colleagues uh, that would participate in this historic hearing. But I really appreciate my Democratic colleagues who many who came back after we finished votes because they knew the significance and the importance of holding this hearing, especially uh, when I talk about the Representative Titus and Cicilline uh, as they put forward the Globe and Global Respect Act uh, that we must pass out of this House and keep pushing till we get it done in the Senate and hit it on the President's desk. So let me just thank you so very much. No one should ever have to experience inhumane treatment, violence, or discrimination for simply being a human being. And you are making a difference. With that, this hearing is now adjourned.